do that so you don't get a big shine on shine like yeah that exactly and yeah. just don't lean forward keith <laughs> yeah I was, that was a little bit big. <laughs> exactly exactly oh like we're, live on. we're live on everything yep. lovely roll it the history of the gallic lands is one of struggle punctuated by moments of sheer brilliance tartan is scotland's gift to the world and it is your personal heritage story howdy boys and girls welcome to kilts and culture i'm rocky that's not eric I'm Keith from McCartan. <laughs> this is Keith Russell. Uh, he's the sales manager. What's your official title? Just Keith. Sales. Just Keith. Just Keith. Just uh, Keith. He's like Madonna or Cher. He's yeah. just Keith. Keith, just um, Keith. Just Keith, just Keith. Yeah. Um, he came all the way from Loch Aaron, from Scotland, flew in specifically to co-chair the show. <laughs> While he's here, he's also going to do a trade show in New Jersey and just kind of like stop by and set up a booth or something. But... We were the main reason yeah. he came to the U.S., of course. It was a quick chat in Glasgow in January. I said he would come, and here I am now. Indeed, indeed. So, and today, special treat. Our, our, our gifted whiskey is smuggled whiskey. Um, Keith was kind enough to bring us this. Uh, the long and the short of it from the Borders Distillery. And this is right near your house, you say, right? Yep, yeah, it's probably about half a mile from my house. So I thought it's quite, I should bring something yeah. med medicinal. Yes, indeed, indeed, yeah. for, for our colds, yes. And uh, behind the uh, behind the camera today, our MC of the day, we have Eric, um, who's not uh, on camera, yo. but he's leaving the camera to come this direction come, to grab his whiskey. Act like Mac. Indeed. Well, hi okay. there. How's it going, Eric? It's going great. Lovely, lovely. So what tartan are you wearing today? I'm wearing the Ever Classic Sterling Tartan. That is a lovely, lovely tartan right there. There's your whiskey. Simple, sweet, to yep. the point. What tartan do you have on today, Mr. Keith? I've got Buchanan Blue, which was the first 100% Scottish wool tartan that we wore from the mill. Nice, very nice, very nice. But more on that later. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful tartan. I really like that one. Mm. Um, and I have one, which you can't see real well. The Stuart Old Weathered Tartan. This was a custom weave. This is fast becoming one of my favorites, just from the uh, fun differentness of it. Indeed. All right. All right. So, whiskey. On to the whiskey bits. So, whiskey. Eric, regale us with some 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 tasting notes. On well, whiskey. hello, Rocky. You're tasting the Sanford. No, the uh, this apparently is a product from from the. Uh, are they calling themselves the the the, dis the borders, borders distillery? The borders, borders distillery, distillery, and they are yes. actually in the border regions, right? Yep, here, it's in here, way down there. Yeah, um, this is part of their workshop series. This is the second one they've done, and what they did to produce this was to combine two whiskeys: one which had a long fermentation time of 150 hours, the other one which only had 55 hour fermentation time. So they took the two of those and then blended them with some single grain to create something that basically <coughs> has a, the benefits of both. That's the theory. Their official tasting notes do not include a nose, though. Okay. So I'm going to give you the nose first that was from a reviewer that I found. And he said the nose reminded him of stewed apple pie, tinned peaches, or more specifically the syrup water that they come in, uh, and then a little bit of charring flavor. Okay. Okay. I think you're uh, uh, leading the horse to water on that, but I, I get the char, the kind of charcoal -y kind of smell in it and that like the sweet mm -hmm. smell from mm -hmm. a tin do you smell anything what do you smell keith well, i can smell it when i walk yeah, past be, it every day with yeah, the dog nice. so it's, it's, it's <laughs> um, <laughs> it smells got, like home it smells yeah it does a wee bit like it then close your eyes smell that then you've got the river on the right hand side you're thinking yep <sighs> it's not bad there is some sweetness to it i don't know if i'd call it peach it's just kind of a vague. It's kind of got of a little bit of an acidic smell mm -hmm. to it for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they're trying to say about the charring, perhaps. Yeah. All right. You All ready? Right. Over the lips and through the gums. Look out, stomach. Here it comes. Slander. 
I've now, some already. Don't they, worry. They, they, they divide the, uh, the official tasting notes divide the palate or the, the flavor into what you're getting theoretically from the short distillation and the long distillation. So the short side gives you a gooseberry skin flavor, citrus zest, and, lem, uh, and green apple. I'll go with the, I've got the apple a bit. Yeah, yeah, the green apple, 100%. Mm -hmm. The, uh, it's got a, uh, hmm. it's got like a, a sugary, like viscosity. Like when you drink like peach, like the juices that the peach come in, mm -hmm. it has like, it's not like water where it's like flat and rough on your tongue. It kind of, if you rub your, rub your tongue on your mouth, it's got like a, a little bit of a, an oily slickness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. in the mouth. Now they, in the mouth feel. The long, what they list as long parts of the tasting, you should be getting some fig pudding and some butterscotch and sultanas. What's a sultana? It's a kind of raisin. Raisin. Okay. Like yeah. the ra it sounds nicer than saying raisin. Mm -hmm. Butterscotch, you said? Yes. Taste it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like... you got to taste more done. of it. No. What, do you not drink whiskey or something? Uh, slight confession. I did drink whiskey. <laughs> um, it's... I had a misspent youth, so... I never really drank whiskey. And it's like, mm, waking learned, up on a Sunday. Learned your lesson. <laughs> waking up on a Sunday morning thinking, oh my God. Then, no. So. You're more of a wine. Yeah. Or. Or beer. Just a beer. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or some of the Irish stuff. Okay. Okay. Oh. So Irish yeah. whiskey, not Scottish whiskey. Oh, Guinness. Okay. Oh. <laughs> like Guinness. That, that Irish. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Got it. But it's. You, you might also say, according to this one reviewer, who I thought seemed like he knew what he was talking about, uh, said he felt like there was a fresh baked pastry kind of a vibe, or lemon sherbet, a little bit of chili flakes, and fig rolls. Chili flakes, I think, is his euphemism for pepperiness. Yeah, Bernie. Oh. Bernie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to water it a touch. I'm going to pour Already a have. little drop of water in it. Would you like any water? Oh, you're fine. No? Okay. We found the one, the one Scottish guy who does not drink whiskey. All right. So water. Ooh. It's a bit. Wow, that changed it. Did it? Mm-hmm. A lot. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, definitely mellowed it out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I cut. I was gonna say it was very. It's still a little like woody acidic to me. Um. But it, it definitely cut, cut it real nice. It, it tamped all the flavors down. It did a bit. There's a lot of pepperiness now. In the on the back, in the middle of my tongue, getting a lot of pepper. I get a weird one. I get like metal taste in the back of my mouth now. Well, that's just a stroke. I was gonna say maybe having a stroke. I'm not sure which. Your dodgy fillings you've got. Exactly. Yeah. No, but it's yeah, it's all in the back of my mouth. Like when you when you you know have metal in your mouth, you chew on metal kind of thing. You have that weird. Uh, in the back of your mouth. You know what I mean? Do you understand the sensation that I'm uh, talking about? I'm still trying to get over my, my, my head around the fig, the fig, figginess about it. I don't get fig. I kind of, I kind of, I've got the green bit. apple. I'll start yeah. the green apple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. But for medicine, it's good. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Eric. Um. Give me a rating, one to 10. How do we feel about the Border Distillery. I don't dislike it. It's not bad, but it's not really sending me either. So I'm just going to go 4.9. 4.9? Yeah. Okay. I'm not, not okay. really in that. Okay. It's not bad. Fair. Scale of 1 to 10. Slightly biased. And it's better than my, my past experience on whiskey. I'll go 8. But I'm really biased. 8. Okay. Gracious. Strong score. Yeah. You would Very. drive somewhere to get this I'd all walk, the way. I'd walk against you. <laughs> You'd drive, travel miles yeah. and miles. Yeah. It's got a story. Um, every whiskey's got a story. So That's true. That's yep. true. I'll give it. I'm not quite as harsh as Eric, but I'm nowhere near as keen as yourself. Hmm. Um, I'll go. Seven one, seven one. With I, I like it better with the water. It it cut it down a little bit, cut some of the acidity I, out. I agree. Now, in fairness, we we just opened it and poured it. We didn't let yeah. it sit. 
So there is that. It probably will improve over time if you let it sit for five, ten minutes before oh, you start drinking. A couple lumps ice and maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's also why you have the, the water. It mm. does the same thing. It doesn't cool it down, though. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Put your whiskey over there. I'm going to remove the table. And boys and girls, put in your question down in the comments below. And we are always, always but your humble servants here to answer whatever questions you have about kilts, about culture, or about La Karen. So, Eric. Yes. What do we have for questions for our, our friend Keith and myself? Well, I'm going to start you off with one from our good friend, Thistleboy1745. Um, who's actually fairly savvy, even though I think he's got the goofiest name I've heard in a while. How influential on trends are historians versus... Innovators and creators like Slange, McCall's, or those guys. Uh, that is to say, how important is the history and traditions of Highland dress to your average Scot versus modern fashion trends? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what and is the what drives what drives it, and how important is it? So, is it driven by um, the higher agencies mm -hmm. or stores that have? Um, kilts, yeah. uh, you know, stores that had their own tartans, um, fashion tartans, and that kind of thing. Or is it driven by um, the mills who create the tartans, or is it driven by historians who you know have you know get people excited about the the old stuff that's been around for years and years and or, years? Or art. Thistle Boy mentioned the uh, the exhibit at the VNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or or you know, let's and let's expand stuff. that because artsy as well as fashion because you know Alexander McQueen was in it. Um, Vivian Westwood was in it. Yeah. There's a lot of different, and I know you guys, Lockerns, worked with Vivian Westwood mm -hmm. um, and a few other fashion houses. Um, so, what do you think drives Highland Dress? Highland Dress itself, you're right. Like I said, Peter McDonald have got the history side of things and they can get access to about every bit of knowledge you can find. Then you've got some of the higher shops, like from Slange, McCall's, Nicholson's, they can dig in and they might find something that's quite relevant to their area. And people buy into it. You've got like sort of McCall's have got the Pride range. Top of my head, I think there's eight what they run with. And that truck that comes like Aberdeen, um, Dundee, Glasgow, and Edinburgh. So they can get them all over. Um Slange is really quite good as well. So they get a mixture of traditional hires. But then if there's any like sort of big events at the music events coming up, they might have a kilt for whoever's on stage. And that promotes it there. So he's on stage in a kilt at a rock concert. It's like, oh, Slange provided that. So it's, it all works. But it's like getting what you, what you like. And obviously the commercial side of things, you get the big fashion houses coming in and using tartan. Tartan never really goes out of fashion. You'll always find it. And every, every season there will be an aspect of tartan or a take on tartan. They might use... <coughs> Armstrong, and they'll make it pink Armstrong, but still the basis, the tartan's still there. And if they get asked to weave it, it's fine, but then they can just tweak it about. Uh, TV celebrities wear it as well. You might somebody find something to wear, and it'll get, generate an interest. I've seen so and so wearing a piece of tartan. Like so yourselves or Rocky might get inquiries. Do you supply this? Can mm -hmm. we have it? Can we have it in this product or that product? And it goes from there to there. Yeah, there was a bunch of queries I know around the the new Doctor Who. He had a kilt on mm -hmm. um, in one of the things. Um, yes. Hmm. So, what do you think drives it more? And do you think it's it's a good thing that the the fashion of it makes it kind of pushes it and drags it kicking and screaming forward, or are you more the uh, uh, traditional? Historical, you know, nobody should mess with the tartans. Clan tartans are good enough. Leave it at that. You probably find clan tartans is so diluted. Like, you've got so many tartans in our range, but they're all clans. And there's a lot of history behind that. We never look at the history. It's just like, it's it's an Anderson. It's a Wilson. We never look at the history behind that. It's it's in our range. We've been had, we've had that for X many years. And we've never really looked at it anymore. If you start digging into it, there is a lot of history on the shelves that we have. But it's just... It's a tartan we supply. If you want to look at history, yeah, you can. Or people might come in specifically. They've dealt, dug into their history, 
and they'll like look at it on the shelf or if they're very, very lucky they'll see it weaving next door in the weaving shed um, <clears throat> or you get some if it's like find an old house and they found like a scrap of tartan and they want to use it for their drapes it's no problem but then it's try to get to that colour which is quite hard sometimes um, the Peter McDonald thing with uh, Glen Affric very fortunate he's got um, how say I got to do it McCall's McNaughton's sorry McNaughton's yeah. McNaughton's um, and it's a commercial tartan as well but it's getting something that's uh, historical and commercial to run side by side is quite difficult and I think the Glen Affric is quite commercial yeah it has a it has a good it's a good story it's got a good story to it yeah, yeah. that's and, and that's ultimately the thing that kind of drives it whether mm -hmm. it's historical or or not it's mm -hmm. it's the story oftentimes that drives the whole thing yeah. so it's one of the things that I, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of of both minds when it comes to tartan and history, is that <clears throat> anything that is stagnant dies. So it needs constant innovation. It needs the the antagonists. It needs the Vivian Westwoods or the McQueens or whoever mm -hmm. to kind of drag tartan into new arenas and do new things and explore new things with it. But it can't lose the common thread. It can't lose the base, the core of the history and the clans and the meaning that it has ultimately. Because if it loses that and it just becomes a plaything for the fashion people, then it loses everything. And it just kind of it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, it's the movie duplicity in real life. Um, so it's yeah, I think it's it's kind of a, a, a weird symbiotic relationship where the fashion drives the interest in tartan in general, which also drives interest in the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna draw a really weird parallel. Um, I got into traditional Irish music from listening to Dropkick Murphys and Flogging Mollies. It's, I got into the fun, youthful type stuff, <laughs> youth, youthful for me at that point <laughs> for the record, um, but I got into it listening to Celtic punk style music. And then I'm like, oh, you know, the uh, the man on the MPTA is actually an old song. Finning its Wake is actually a traditional mm. Irish song. Then I start listening to different versions of that song sung by different Irish musicians. And it's like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Um, so it's it's a fun way to back more people into it in, from a weird angle or, or create a bigger tent where more people are exposed to it and and can enjoy it and, you know, have fun with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, huh? Oh, you're right. Some of the, I've never heard some of these bonds. <laughs> some weird stuff. You're really um, old, dude. Yeah. But the same again, like, it, it generates interest, and it's like, if you may see, like, a, a Vivian Westwood fashion piece, you're thinking, all right, can I get that tartan? And it is, it is a, a traditional tartan on the shelf. You can actually go in and buy a yard, two yards. You can buy a tie. You can buy a scarf. And that, and it's almost like a Vivian Westwood piece. But it's, it's such a... A traditional tartan, like a Bruce yeah. Kinnaird. Oh, yeah, she's it's all there. over it's that. It's all over yeah. there, like a McQueen. Well, the, the clues in the name there, like. Yeah. Um, so, um, but no, it's. Yeah. And that one with the VNA, it's like I've never seen as many fashion pieces. And I'm thinking, whoa, when did that happen? Like, um, and I think the, the last one I saw of it there was uh, Billy Conley's Grand Marshal outfit. It was there. I'm thinking, wow, oh. And that's available. You can still buy that tartan. It's still relevant, and it's like 10 years old. Bruce Kinnaird, God yeah. knows how old that is. Exactly. It's still relevant. So Yeah, indeed. Oh. All right, Mr. Eric. Okay. Uh, Susan Frazier <coughs> had this to say. She says, in the U.S., we often see a surge in interest in kilts due to popular media, mm -hmm. like Braveheart and Outlander, obvious examples. Do you guys see that happening in Scotland too? Uh, how much of an influence on Highland wear or tartan sales is there from the media? And if it's not media, what drives the trends? Right. I'll, I'll let you, if you want to jump in on this one. Media does drive some interest in the product. Um, a while ago we had, when Meghan Markle came to Scotland to show her a, a black watch coat the many, many inquiries we've got for, do you have black watch coats? No, we've got black watch. But then when you see it and again, it, it does. Um, or you've got, we had a program in the UK, Traitors, and it was filmed in Scotland at a castle and the host, Claudia Winkleman, 
championed like Scottish designers and product. So every night, well, it was I think it was twelve episodes it was on for. Every episode she had a, a new piece of clothing on, like tartan tweeds, and it the amount of inquiries that gets for, for one TV presenter, she probably got tens of thousands and like following on Instagram and Facebook. But being on TV does generate, and it's just like oh, it, it does so. Going back to the last bit, it's like Tartan never really goes out of the public interest. It's always there. Um, it's commercial. Uh, Outlander, Braveheart. It, yeah, it still works. But it generates an income throughout Scotland, not just on the Tartan side of things, from the tourism. tourism. Like, go to the, the Clooney Stains or the castles and just the scenery. People like, And on the back of that, when Rockingham was on a little road trip in January, you probably visited most <coughs> of the sites there as well. Yeah, you did. Yeah, now it's, I I agree. It's it's we answer this question, you know, on mm -hmm. the regular. So I was very interested in getting your guys' take on it. Um, it's I I love seeing how you know culture and commerce and fashion and and what people are interested in all kind of blend together. So you know, if something's on TV, we have other phrases we use like the the the, the Downton Abbey effect yeah. or the Peaky Blinders effect and tweed coming into fashion has really influenced Highland wear a bit from the outside where tweeds have been you know hugely popular for us I'm assuming for you guys yep. as well in the last let's say eight to ten years it's yeah. kind of really come into its mm -hmm. own and then weathered tartans off the back of that yeah. because of Outlander being, you know, having weathered tartans in the show and those blending well with the mm -hmm. tweeds at the same time. So it's a neat, you know, you can you can see how the effect um, of the show or what the effect the shows have on fashion on on some level, you know, mm -hmm. you know great or small. You're right, yeah, it does. But f fashion is fashion and it never really goes out of fashion, as I said before, it's... But it's good. It it generates a lot of interest, and it's like maybe how, how, where it comes from and where how we do it, and we'll probably touch on this later on. It is a dying trade. Like so, the more people know about it and where it comes from, it's good. Yeah, the I I find it amusing that uh, uh, the, the people who talk, the people who know about fashion, not me for the record. Not me. <laughs> <coughs> you look very fashionable. Thank what you. are you talking yeah. about? Um, the people who know about fashion, every time you hear, you know, what's the in color for the season? Mm -hmm. What are the in trends? Oh, tartan is in right now, but it's always freaking in. Every time that thing comes out, like seasonally or yearly or whatever it is, tartan's in. Like, no shit. Tartan is always in. Tartan is beautiful by itself. It doesn't need fashion's help, but fashion helps it, you know, in getting exposure. But it, it's just... Yeah, it's always there. It's great. It's part of the scenery. It's part of the background, but it's steeped in such meaning that it's, yeah, I don't even know where I'm going with it. I just, I, I find it amusing where people figure out, like, they're discovering it for the first time. Like, oh, tartan. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Such a concept of warped and, warp and weft stripes that overlap. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we get that in, uh, reaction sometimes. We take people in, in the warehouse. And it's like open. It's like we we got a phrase like kids in the sweet shop. They come down the stairs and you open the door and it's like wow. I'm like yeah, it's all the tartans here. Like so. Yep. Then you ask them what they're looking for and it's like they come up with a list and you're thinking, oh right. So they know like, looking for their clan tartans and just like fashion ones. It's like do we have this? Do you have that? No, that's X mill. That's other mill. But we'll try and work together. And if it's like not ours, I will say it's somebody else's and I'll tell them where they can get them about. Um, <laughs> If not, try and sell them something. When I was similar, <laughs> yeah. No, it's but the one one thing that I I I love about this trade, and I say it say it often, is that there's there's not really a lot of bad blood. It's a oh. very small industry, and the mills all work together. Like you're planning on, you know, saying hi to Nick from House of Edgar when you yep. get at a trade show. Mm -hmm. You know, we all, you know, for the most part, we all know each other, um, and it's a very friendly and friendly cutthroat environment no mm -hmm. it's not cutthroat it's more friendly it's you know you guys mm -hmm. try to stay out of each other's ponds to some degree yeah there is, there is a crossover sometimes too like when you go into like the higher shops they all have our books martin mills strathmore side by side and it's, it goes that people's taste but rock is right uh the trade show in january it's a scottish trade show and we all we're all in, in, in their different bays but at night all the traders we all socialise together 
and it's like it's good listening to some of their stories and like what problems they've got what problems we've got <laughs> which customers are problems I didn't know what to say that like eh? but, uh, some of the really good you, USA yeah. kilts isn't a problem no they're but then it's like, do you have this? Do you have that? Oh, I never thought of that. And we all help each other. And it's, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a good industry to be in. It really And it's is. got smaller and smaller. Um, I think there's a table of 10, and that was like most of the Scottish um, woolen industry sitting around this table. like, And it was like really interesting. And listening to like, like Dawn, my boss, she was speaking on her experiences. And I had Christine speaking. And Kevin is like, I never, it was like, it's like being at school. I was paying attention for once there, like at school, I never paid attention. But I listened and I was like, I knew stuff. I think, oh, but it's great learning stuff like that from other people around the table. Then when Rocky fires a question at you on a Friday when you're sitting in your car outside your house waiting to go home, and the wife's waving at the window, I'm going, it's Rocky on the phone. Like, it's just, oh, gee whiz. Uh, it's fine. So, in fairness, <laughs> it was before five o'clock your time. I did not call you after hours. No, it's fine. But it's just, we have to stick together to keep it alive. If, it, if we don't stick together, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Agreed. So, stick together. Yeah. Yeah. That answered the question and a whole lot more. There you go. All right, Eric. Uh, just a real quick aside, you might want to take note <coughs> of the design of Keith's Sporin Rockies. See if Ooh. that's something we would do, getting some love Ooh, for that very one. Nice. Yeah. That's, yeah. See, that's one of... Uh, Morrison's standard sporn designs. We make we make ours fancy and different. I did, I did notice it yours, and I thought, oh, it's got fancy sporn on. Oh, hold on, hold on. Um, we're, we're gonna zoom in on Keith's crotch yeah. right there. <laughs> but for for the visit, when we had the King visit in July, there, I uh, put the Highland cow sporn on, and it was one of those that came into the store. We thought that'll never sell. It's one of the best ones, and I think Margaret Morrison, I think they've run out of the the Highland coo, yeah, the Highland coo, and it, it works because on the cartel. It's oxidized too, and it's got the Highland Coo in it, and it's really a nice spore. Nice. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there's a lot of really, really cool, innovative spore mm -hmm. designs, and that's one thing that I like. We're going off on a tangent. Don't care. We're already off the rails. Um, the, the one thing that I like is uh, uh, differences. When people, companies try to do different things, mm -hmm. and the amount of bog standard plain old sporins that mm -hmm. were around in the 90s, you know, in the 2000s, when we were first mm -hmm. starting out in business, it was like, would you like this sporin from this company or from that company or from that company? It was all essentially the same thing. And now there's mm -hmm. starting to be a lot more variation. There's throwback Victorian kind of things. Yeah. There's a lot more things to play with, a lot more individualism mm -hmm. um, within sporins as well as within tartans. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see more and more flavors of things coming out um, and like a lot of the ones that we do, we come up with our own designs because we want our, our own styles, similar yeah. to how Greg has his different ones, this company has their different ones. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sorry. You, you know Greg, when he makes it, it's an amazing little place when you go and visit it. It's like, and the knowledge what Greg's got from historical studies, things as well. Mm -hmm. And if you say, can you try this? He'll either say, I or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then there's like companies like Dolman's mm. who has like an amazing back catalog mm -hmm. of, of different cantle designs and things like yeah. that. And they, they, they only stopped having some of their, you know, back catalog in designs and stuff because of a fire from, you know, 100 years yeah. ago. So it's, it's, it's neat to kind of dig through the history bits. So, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a part of the industry that's having and going to have further resurgence mm -hmm. is looking more, looking more backwards, not just looking forwards, but looking backwards at the same time, looking mm -hmm. for inspiration in in victorian things in you know in edwardian things all these old 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 styles coming back into into fashion again for people to to play with it and have something different and original yeah do you agree or disagree with I that do. take it does and it's like it's, it's a timeless piece and then if you think about it that could be it could go down three or four generations passing down the family and it's still got that story it's part of you and you fire it down the line um but no it's that's just my, my lucky spawn like for when I go out working just I thought from a TV appearance I'll put this on uh, but I've got one what I bought maybe 20 years ago and you're right it's just like a box standard and that's what you could get but now the range is and it's huge and like what you can get your spawn made out of it's like alright you mm -hmm. almost have to google to find out what that actually is and I think the latest one was a coyote yeah 
the oh, this, forever, you're forever you fancy. Yeah, no, no. this distressed leather. Um, this is a, a collaboration with me and Greg trying to come up with something other than just the regular flat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, dark tan is what he calls like that one. Yeah. But coming up with something with a little bit more character and old worldly mm -hmm. kind of feel to yeah. it. Looks like it's beaten up before you ever get it. Mm -hmm. um, so just innovation there. And the other thing that's really, really innovated um, Sporins as well, laser etching. Yeah. Because you're not stuck in, you know, investing in a hundred dollar brass stamp or, or a couple hundred dollar brass stamp to be able to match you know do one design on this particular sporin mm -hmm. you can set you know set the program and have a laser etch done in whatever design you want yeah. so you can do one offs you could do a bunch of different stuff mm -hmm. so yeah i love i love the the innovation that's coming out of it yeah good. tangent but good non-question yeah thank you people for pointing at his crotch oh, that was from noah so thank you noah cheers um I'm jumping to a question from Carl Taylor, who had asked this to, of us before. He's wondering what's going on with herringbone salvages. Are they a thing? Are they a thing that you would offer, or is there are they we, problematic for mills or what? We can offer it only in a single wedge loom, um, but it's it's only done on very rare occasions. It's quite a it's an expensive item to do. To do. It takes a bit longer and there's a bit more work in it, and it's. We've decided not to run with it like in our like a, our range. One, it's not really commercial enough. But if somebody wants to come along and design a kilt, prime example was the king. He came along and his kilt has got the hair and bone <coughs> salvage. Yeah, but if you want to have one as well, we can do it. It's, but it's, it goes through a single width loom, a bit like what House Edgar run with. It's got the adaptation on it. We can do it. Now, I, for for the viewers out there, for the record, when he says we can do it, what's the minimum amount of yardage that you would sell as a single width piece? We could do 120 meters, which is like a 60 meter piece. So not enough for one kilt, Carl. No, that's the point. It's one kilt. Exactly. Um, the when it when it comes to short lengths, yeah, a lot of mills don't want to do it because it costs a lot. It's, it's, it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to set up the loom, to set up the you know to get the warping done. It just the a lot of I've I've said to people before, and tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, a lot of the time in setting up the loom or in in the in the cost of the cloth mm -hmm. is setting up the loom yeah, and getting it through the entire process of you know picking out the colors, loading up the machine, getting the warping drawn done up, then getting mm -hmm. the weft threads all settled in. Then you know you you spend in let's say a few hours before you even turn the machine on to start weaving. Yeah, 100%. You, be, you do it like from the very start to finish. If it's got specific dyes, the dyeing side of things, then if it comes to the warping, but then when it comes to warping, it doesn't go straight into that loom. You'll need to work out if it's a single with the hair and bone salvage, you'll need to make up the calm and do all the, the hiddles, make it up there. It's a, it's a, you may find it probably take three days to go from it being warped to actually be knotted and ready to go in your loom. And that's not what you've got to say, it's got to be bang right on. Right on, so yeah. It may take almost about 10 days to weave that, get it up and running, as opposed to like a double width loom, you could do 80 meters in one day. Yeah. There's the commercial side of things like, but then if you want it, we can do it, but there's a big minimum. Yeah, it's, to make it worth a while. Yeah, it's yeah. the opportunity cost is what it's called in in in, in business speak. Uh, it's the opportunity cost. What else could they have been doing mm -hmm. in the same amount of time they were doing that for mm -hmm. you? Um, and that's that has to factor into the cost, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Now, I'm curious. Um, I don't know enough about it, so I'm I'm speaking a little bit out of turn, and I don't know if you know anything about it. What was the the provenance? How did herringbone salvage become a thing? When was it a thing? Or Eric, if you have any knowledge on this, if if you want to jump in, mm. herringbone salvage on tartans. Was it why was it done, and or when was it done, and or was it always a big pain in the butt to do on uh, like a dob cross loom yeah. or an old you know a shuttle you know shuttle style loom versus the the newer style rapier looms yeah. like you have now? To be honest, I have no idea. Okay. I don't have I don't have technical information. No, <clears throat> I can I can speculate that basically is an earlier way of making sure you have a secure salvage. A straight edge. Considering older mm. technologies, making sure that you're actually getting something that was not going to fray. Right. Whereas now, because of the pressure you can put on the threads in modern looms and stuff like that, the kinds of salvage we see now mm -hmm. do just fine. But back in the day, 
when the tolerances weren't as good, perhaps herringbone was a way of making sure that it was you know, a, hmm. a nicer salvage. Yeah, nicer yeah, that, and, and that, that solid. Sounds about you right, didn't have yeah. to risk risk hmm. it fraying. That's speculation there. Understood. No, but I'm I'm gonna go down this rabbit hole for a minute. Um, the I know like on a Dob cross loom. Uh, like an old style mm-hmm. shuttle loom with yeah. a with a regular you know, just a regular twill all yeah. the way down to the bottom with the shuttle, getting the the tension on each shuttle mm-hmm. to be equal across yeah. all the shuttles, and the shuttle is basically a little you know wooden thing that shoots back and forth, and it has thread on it. That's what you know, throws in the weft threads into you know into the loom. Now, the uh, and, and each color has its own shuttle. So once you know you're you're reaving, reaving royal steward, so it's going back and forth with red, then it changes to blue. So you need a different shuttle to go with the blue. But if the if the blue or the green or whatever has a different tension on it, then it's going to actually like pull in the edge of the cloth a little bit. So instead of having a nice flat, perfectly mm-hmm. you know even bottom. It's going to go red, then the blue is going to pull up a little bit, then it goes over to green, then over to red, then back up to the blue, and it's going to just kind of have a little bit of a wave to the bottom of the cloth. Um, would the herringbone selvage help counteract that potentially? Yeah, it should. Okay. It you know more about weaving than yeah, I do. I'm just trying to visualize it now. Like, yeah, well, can I remember going back, like what Rookie's saying, using the shuttle looms, you had the listings up the side, so you're, you're red and it changing. It all came down to the tension. It was worse if you had like a, like a change of colours, like maybe like four or six threads. It was really tight. Mm-hmm. But if it was going over like maybe like twenty threads or more, it had more space, so it wasn't as tight. But if you think the pin, what was inside the the shuttle going back and forward, it's not got the same tension at the very top as it's at the bottom or in the middle, because it's wound on. It's just a loose item. Yeah. And every every pin machine was different. There's no. You had a bit pin t- machine is the thing that wraps the. No, the pin machine was like put the. the uh, the sp- the- you got the shuttle. You know, get the shuttle. <laughs> right there. Hi. Can't you Bring see the it? Shuttle. That's the wood <laughs> and shuttle. And inside right that, there. you put your pin, and that was like your, your cone of yarn was inside there. Yeah. So, you know, it was like, it's almost like if you think of a pea shooter. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Pea shooter inside this shuttle, wrapped around, we all wrapped around that, and when it got fired across, there's a little hole on the top of the, the, the shuttle. That's what the thread drew the thread out. Yeah. So you had like the uptake where it was sitting still, it went back in, and it went, whew, that was quick. Relax. Then it gets fired back across again, so it's like tense up. Right. Then relaxed. So it's tensed up and relaxed. It went across tense and it relaxed. Yeah? Okay. But it was like the pin was in there. And some of the mills, I remember when first started in the mill, we had a pin machine. And there was a, a tension gauge that you try to make it. But then you're using different, if you're using like fancy yarns, you might use a worsted was like maybe set like you said tension four, or if you're doing like a, a slubby yarn, you might keep the tension quite slack, but it's quite a, a slubby yarn. Yeah. So each thing's got to do it differently. Like, but when it's firing back and forward, you can't just slow it down or speed it up the limit. Just it just goes goes when yeah. it goes. Then with the idea of the the new rapier looms, it's on a selector, so it's it winds itself into a spool off the cone, and it's held on at tension. So when it comes off that select of the selector into the loom every thread's exactly the same yeah? yeah it's set up like that and the idea is we get the selvage nice we've got a tuck in selvage and the heron bone selvage is almost it's like the old fashioned version of a tuck in yeah and you're getting a nice edge yeah which should be straight <laughs> so should what, should so what you're saying is what you're saying is I was right Indeed. Yeah, no, you, right. you, you you helped suss it out there. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. I mean, you're up behind, like, do you think, oh, yeah. Back to Canary. Exactly. Rapier looms up here, shuttles down here. We yeah. got to remember that. Yes. I, I think it'd be quite dodgy trying to bring a, a, a shuttle through customs, might be a wee bit interesting. Well, yeah. we'll we'll have after we do this video, we uh, we edit it and stuff. We'll have a picture of a shuttle so people will know what you're yeah. talking about. So and when the, he was the, the when you were doing this, the, we'll have a yeah. shuttle in your hands yeah. right there. And mm-hmm. the varying size, because sometimes I've got a couple on the desk. But like it's like for a people like a, like a hand loom, right? It's like for a like small, a, tiny one. a small tiny one. It's only probably year wide. You got a little little baby shuttles. Little baby. But then you but then you've got I've got like there's like an 18 inch one, and it's like it's a monster. Right. So if you can imagine that's getting fired back and forward, it will clatter back and forth. And that's like the the, the noise in the old weaving sheds was so bad. 
mm. is with these things knocking back and forward. Right. And if you think you've got six colours in every loom and they're all going at different speed or different times, yep. it will be quite noisy. Indeed. Like a Led Zeppelin concert, full blast. <laughs> <laughs> Led Zeppelin concert? How old are you? No, actually, how old are you? I'm curious. 54. 54? Okay. I'm not that far behind yeah. you. I'm catching up. So I, I left school at 16 and I, went, I finished on the Friday and started in the mills on the Monday. Nice. So being in circuit, you could do that. You could like finish schools. And the idea is you just went there. There's plenty of jobs and it was quite secure. Right. Then the world changes a little bit. Like, so. Oh, you're yeah. still here. You're still standing. Yeah. And it's like said before, like having dinner with all the other textile companies. It's like being at school again. Like, there's so much information out there. Oh, I know. I yeah. know. And that's that's the the beautiful thing and scary thing simultaneously is 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 having all the knowledge and seeing like the people who actually know all these things the institutional knowledge that is held in this industry in a mm -hmm. small group of people knowing those people is actually really really cool it's also scary as hell mm -hmm. because we have what we call the hit by a bus rule here at USA Kilts where if anyone gets hit by a bus we have to make sure there's someone who else can do that particular thing so that scares that scares mm -hmm. me about the industry, but it's also mm -hmm. really awesome to know and like watch it, watch those people converse and you know mm -hmm. interact. Yeah. It's great, but it's weird because you get some visitors in the factory, like, and it's like a family coming down. The grandparents are there, and you may have found the grandparents worked in the mill years <coughs> ago, and and the principle is exactly the same. Like the warping's never really changed. And coming to the weaving, and they're like, "Oh, it's got it's gone a bit quicker now, son." I'm like, no, it is. <laughs> Because like hopefully they're going like the the, loom, the, the looms that we run are about 400 to 400 like 550 picks per minute, so it's going to feel lick like yeah yeah yeah. Like, and it's was like, a dob cross like 125? Oh, was it? it's 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 night and day like we yeah. See it, ju, 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 ju. But then it's got it's a and the single width is about 250 picks per minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's it's magical listening to it like yeah, and I remember like listening to some of the old like the mills when the shuttle looms were working, you could hear them miles away like him and it's you could hear the noise you're going down the weaving shed with us it, the noise is there it's slightly different it's like it's still you know it's it's quieter it's quieter but then it's going a heck of a lot quicker yeah <laughs> um. it's more of a hum hmm. ah yes okay mr eric huh what oh i'm awake Indeed. Yeah, there. yes um keith do you do any hiking or anything uh yes hiking hill yeah. walking stuff like that um, okay quite fortunate Cool. Um, I have a question here from a one Derek Hughes, who is currently a fan of utility style kilts from a hiking and camping standpoint. He finds them very uh, practical. Mm -hmm. uh, they're light and quick drying, he says. However, how would such a kilt fare if he was walking on the West Highland Way getting soaked? I think it'd be okay because it is naturally <coughs> water repellent. Mm, but he's talking about no. utility kilts, which are usually utility, cotton. 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 Yeah. Downside is midges mm. Mm -hmm. I would be covered up 10 inch of my life because for those explain what midges are for those who don't uh, know a little fly what's vicious <laughs> mm -hmm. it basically gnats that bite yeah and you come out like if you've got chicken pox and they're like you're just like oh fresh meat bang <laughs> that's you yeah you could wear a utility kilt there is people who've done it there's a chap done it uh, over lockdown, he walked like the length, and he walked around the whole of Scotland, and he'd lived in his great kilt, and yeah. he came to that, and it, it did work. Um, it'd be okay, like it might need laundered after your trip. Um, <laughs> Just maybe you may want to wade into you may want to wade into a lock or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you probably could get away with it. It would be handy sometimes too, like if it's if it's pouring the rain, you get your ja waterproof jacket on. You can put your hands in your pockets. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's for utility kilts. If it is a canvas utility kilt, I would be I would be a bit leery if the weather is going to be wet. Yeah. Because cotton holds oh. water. It will soak it up, and it will be heavy, and then it will start to chafe. So I would be a little bit leery if it's if the weather if it is weather dependent. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you have something uh, like didn't utility kilts do like a Spartan? Or something like they did something yeah, that's like bloody awful. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> nylon. Yeah, scorch. if you had something I mean, that's uh ugh. like a maybe if it was ripstop or something that had like a lighter weight, mm -hmm. um, and it was a faster drying thing, sure. If it is a heavier, thicker, denser cotton or a canvas, um, 
you're probably going to chafe and it's going to get yeah it's going to get heavy yeah i'd still go with the wool and i think keith is absolutely correct that mm-hmm. basically the you know his first response was to say well yeah it sheds water and it's like yeah wool is what you want mm-hmm. there's a reason why they wore wool in the highlands mm-hmm. for hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of years mm-hmm. so i wouldn't do the cotton duck i would do, do wool if you're gonna but do it you can't guarantee the weather it's not going to be like tropical well it may be it may look tropical when you come across it for a nice lovely cove mm-hmm. but there'll always be there's rain around the corner yeah it's, it's fresh like uh, you like but no you could get away with it you know you could get away with it yes it's i w- i would say this i would posit this bring a pair of uh like quick drying hiking shorts yeah period bring those because if it's if it fails as a plan you gotta have a backup plan um so if it's if it works great but the the lightweight shorts you just throw in the back of your sack great they have an option so if, if plan a fails you have plan b it's probably probably if you use your kilt and your walk, walk around scotland it's a good icebreaker as well because somebody will always ask one what's your what are you wearing a kilt for two what's the tartan then probably three I'll go Scottish where, again are you where are you from because you're not because <laughs> yeah. you're not Scottish <laughs> are you off your head <laughs> um, but yeah I'd get a bash like yeah. yeah do it try it report back mm-hmm. tell us how it went absolutely alright Eric okay back to the business side of things uh, Billy P asked us uh, he, he comments that uh, he knows that LeCaron was sold in 2011 mm-hmm and went from being a family-owned operation to a company owned by a global brand. How have things changed and how have they stayed the same since that happened? Right. Um, we're give, it, give us a bit of the history. History. Yeah. Uh, Locarno was a, a family-owned company up until 2011. Um, the latter years was a bit turbulent just with the world in general and where money was coming from and we were having to invest and put money into the business, like, and it was you were getting no return. What you're putting in, it wasn't coming out. Yeah, remember this is this is during the 2008, you know, housing collapse. Mm-hmm. It's during the recession. That's yo know, U.S., but that affected Everybody. world economy as well. Uh, and you were like, you were, all the mills were having problems. It, it back was in it was tough. It was very tough. Like, and I remember going in some days, thinking, right, one, is the door going to be locked? And it was like on a Monday, especially thinking, right. Then you're looking at stock on the shelves, and it's like, it's a bit like gorgonzola cheese. There's so many holes in the stock. On a positive note, it's not like that now. After lockdown, it was. We had lots of holes in the stock, but we've topped it up. Yes, at that time of year, it was it was damn scary, like, where we were going. And they were like, right, have we got a job? Have we not got a job? It was like, right, what do we do? What's plan B? And it's like, if we lost that, there was another mill gone. Then if, if we went, did that ro- have an effect on other mills or higher industries? Where did we get their stuff? Yeah. And it's just like Selkirk's a small town as well, five, six thousand people. Yeah, we employ people from all over the borders, but we generate income in the town as well. It's thinking, right? Um, you got Susie's like um, snack bar. Would that survive? Because we have to use it like for salad rolls every now and then. Not Susie. Yeah. And her snack bar. Snack bar. It's we things like that. So the knock on, like, and just in yeah. general in the town, like, yeah, it's like. And you get people in the street, like people who had worked in Locarno in the past, asking you, thinking, what's happened at Locarno? I'm thinking, well, I don't know, I'm still there. Like, oh, I heard this. So the, the uncertainty and rumour, what was rife, it was like, yep. it was like pretty demoralised. And then there was a lot of bad things going on in the background, which I wasn't, I was I was on that side of the fence, no, this side. And it was like, right, this is happening. And Alistair Buckingham got us all in, the, in the, the main office one day and said, look, and it was big hand up to him like for him to stand up and say due to the financial things the, he couldn't afford to keep the company going and he's actually sold it to this company the management were looking to buy out but there was a couple of backers pulled out so that didn't help so this company came along they knew the brand um, they're a Korean multinational company and they've got interests within Europe and they knew they must have done their back a bit of homework and they realised we've got a great market for the product Worldwide and, and in Scotland, they never really got the head round why we don't sell tartan to England. There is reasons, but just well. a small one. So th- once they got us, took us over, like it was, it was, it was a trial and error. Like 
what they thought would work and what we th were trying to tell them would work. It's a bit like a marriage. Like, so you say you like, I say tomato, you say tomato. Tomato, yeah. Right? It's a bit like that. So it took a few years for them to get their heads around, like, we'll just leave us where we are. And they've got faith in us. Don and the team's worked really hard for them. We've had, the, we've had Koreans working with us in the factory. Now we've got, there's a, a Korean director based in Europe, but looks after like a couple of companies in Italy, one in England and us. A few different brands, yeah. And we, we report to him, then he reports to like Eland itself. But when you look at the, the main company, it's, it's a huge company. We do work for them as well. Um, we, we do produce for them. But main state, they've just left us on our own. And all the investment we've put in our company recently, we've we've self-funded that. So we've no had like help from like the the main company behind us. We've just done it ourselves, and they're happy with it to do that. And it's like put faith back in the company. So it has taken. It's been a long journey, but it's we're all still here, and we're doing what we're doing. And it's like, and there's a few bottles of wine being drunk over that, but. <laughs> By Crikey, it's <clears throat> it's a good story. And if you went back, like some of the TV soaps, some TV now, like Doki soaps, it'd be an interesting one to see what people would think about how we went through. Um, yeah. And it's like, yeah, there has people left the company and went on to do other things within the business still. But there's a lot of people still in the factory who went through all the turbulent years and and stuck with it. And we took we took like a wage cut as well to kind of help things along, just to keep the company going. Like so. It's <coughs> yeah. It's, it's like a, a family. You do that for your family. Well, some of us do. Some of that. Yeah. <laughs> but the, <coughs> so it's our job as in security as well, and our family as well. Like so, you have to like put some faith in it. It's 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 again. It's it's scary, and to see how precarious position the the industry can be in if one mill or two mills go away. Mm. Um, like it's 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 not total ruin, but it, it, it's kind of close. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I knew Lock Karen was, was at a point back then where, you know, the rumors are flying. Um, I tried, you know, not to listen to them as, as much as possible, but there was, there was a lot of rumors and yeah. it's, I can't imagine what it would be like actually working in the company and hearing rumors about my own company. And I don't know if they're true or not. And, you know, is, is Lock Heron going to continue on Highland Wear with these people buying them? And what are they mm -hmm. going to do? And is they just going to go just become a, 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 an extension of this particular brand mm -hmm. who's only going to supply to them? Are they going to do Highland Wear at all? Um, so it's, it's, I'm happy to see that the, 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 the parent company kind of, you know, Tried, tried to force it and make it go. And A, you guys stood your ground to mm -hmm. some degree and pushed back on it and said, this is what we are. This is what we are good at. This is how we can continue and thrive. We just, we went through a turbulent period because of the collapse of you know the entire economy, but it's not, doesn't mean we're a bad company. It means that we're gonna come out on the other side, a better company, because we're gonna be leaner and meaner. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they believed in it enough to sink money in, sink in new looms, sink in new technology, and get you guys back on your feet. Yeah. And now coming out the other side, the fact that you are profitable, the fact that you can self-fund, you don't have to rely on them constantly injecting cash to keep the business afloat, you're doing it yourselves. That's a very, very good sign. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's it helped to save the industry. I can't imagine what would happen, you know, forget Forget the local economy. I can't yeah. if, imagine what would happen to the rest of the tartan world if Lock Heron had gone or House of Edgar had gone. One of the big, you know, Scottish mills had gone away. That would leave a a gaping hole that would be tough to fill. I mean, sure, some of the other mills would pick up some of the mm -hmm. you know, pick up some of the business and stuff, but they wouldn't want to carry you know every single individual tartan that Lock Heron carries. Nope. They wouldn't want to carry all the 11 ounce as well, or 10 ounce as well as 13, as well as 16, as well as tweeds, as well as everything else. Mm -hmm. So, if you went back to like Selkirk in like say like 50s, early 60s, there was like sort of the big mill chimneys. There was like 16 mill chimneys running down the length of where the industrial state is. So each m chimney represented either a spinning mill, a weaving mill, or finishing. Like so, 
there's a lot of industry in there, like a, a dye and house. It, it, dye, and it's, it's just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And we did have a big dye house in Selkirk. Unfortunately, it went in fire. <laughs> so that didn't help. So As they do. As they do, yeah. <laughs> then we've got smaller businesses. And the site what we're in the now was uh, like almost like a vertical mill. It was Gardeners of Selkirk. So where our weaving shed, what is, is it was there. Yarn, so the greasy wool came in there. Then they spun it. Then it zigzagged all the way through the factory, and it came out the other end as woven product. Yeah. M- m- a lot of tweeds in that as well. Like, but they didn't specialise in tartans. But so we've kind of moved into an- another factory, but still keeping a bit of history going. Like when you look along, there's big buildings, like four or five storey mill buildings, which employed a whack of people, and there's nobody there like it. What kind of uh, measurement is a whack? Is that like a metric whack. ton? Ha, <laughs> whack of people. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> whack of people. If you can remember, like, if you visualize, like, when when the when it, like, the mill lunchtime whistle went, or it went, finished at half past four, you get knocked over the amount of people coming out the mills. Then they're like ants work going away, going yeah, yeah. homes and that. And it's like, and but then some of the fit spinning factories, they bust people in from other towns. So there's like mill buses sitting to take people. There was a mill bus sat on the road opposite. We call it the low road because it's low. Yeah. It sat there and took people up the town. So there's a, the mill bus took people up, up the town. Yeah. Because Selkirk being Selkirk it is on a hill. So all the factories are on the bottom of the hill. So but we, we bus people in from other towns and it's like. And how many mills are left in Selkirk, do you think? Weaving mills, two. See, that's this is this is the precarious position that, uh, and this is not meant to be a, a a bleeding heart commercial for Scotland, for the record. But this is the this is the precarious position that the industry is actually in is the institutional knowledge, because once the mills start closing, the institutional knowledge, the people that work there, they go elsewhere. They find mm. new jobs. They find new you know areas to explore in their lives. They go down to you know they they travel, um, and if all of that knowledge goes away, it's very, very difficult to bring it back. You have to find some of the old timers who have retired and who live mm-hmm. there to help, you know, cl- kick and, you know, scratch and claw to get the knowledge back before those people die or they move out of the area. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thrilled that A, it didn't go away oh. and B, it, it does still exist, but it also underscores the fact that you know we need to support mm. Scottish mills. Period. Yeah, you're right in saying you had one of the old worthies. Like I spoke to one the other week, and he went, "I've got some old mill things. Are you interested?" I was like, "As in what?" He went, "Well, just bits and bobs." So when I go back, probably next couple of weeks, I'll go see him because he's got a wealth of knowledge. He, he ran his wee little, he had a wee weaving shed of his own, so he's got stuff. That hopefully, be quite interesting to see what he's got. Obviously, he might want some money for it. Like so. I'll, I'll <laughs> I'll sell him a scarf. <laughs> That's very kind of you. I'll give him a scarf. Um. All right, Eric. Uh, going from the struggles and trials and tribulations to more positive, I think, uh, we had Christopher Hills commenting that he's a shepherd and he knows that our own U.S. wool market, which has been weak for decades, uh, actually collapsed during COVID completely. Mm-hmm. So what he's wondering is, how are things going with the new line of British grown wool mm-hmm. strom fabric that LeCaron is doing? It, and I happen to know that we do, it's good this came in because we actually have a, a video on that project that we can show people if you guys want to. Sure. Yeah. You want to do that first? Yeah, yeah. This okay. is LeCaron's this is, this is video. This uh, homegrown wool project. Cool.
So, Keith, the the new British wool. Mm -hmm. What was the what were the the ration, What was the rationale to do it? Right. And tell me about it. It's been a kind of long term project. It was kind of muted at the start of 2020 that there's a possibility it was a little thing that happened yeah. i mean it was like there, there's something else happened in between and it was like there's there's enough wool in the system for us to produce wool to a time our strong quality it was a mixture of rumley marsh and cheviot sheep um at the very start it was the percentages was like the rumley marsh had to come from south of the border can't help that it's fine but then recently as of like for the past like 18 month all the wool we we're getting now is 100% Scottish and that's some great work with um, British wool sourcing the wool and they're working with their spinners so we and then it's coming to us so it's it's hard to work like but then you think you look at all the sheep in Scotland you think oh, it, it'll work but it doesn't work you have to use certain breeds to get that yeah the strong, hand. strong weight yeah and it causes a little bit of problems too because the guard hairs are different and it takes the dyes up slightly different so it's not just straightforward, like putting a white cone in the dye pot a couple of hours later, it's got the right colour. There's a bit more to it as well. But then on the, the other side of things, British wool worked damn hard to get the wool out and in the market. Yeah, some of the wool isn't it's fit only fit like for insulation. But there is a market for every part of it. And it's just getting out. And you know the American wool just flat bottomed. And I think you may have to look at that, it'd be I think the Irish market didn't exactly the same on the wool. It hmm. flat bottom. British wool work really hard in promoting and it's like it's weird. We went up to the Highlands show in Edinburgh, it's like a big agricultural show on the British wool stand. And I didn't realise how much product you could get made out of the wool. Not just like what we wear now. Mm -hmm. There was there was string, hmm. there was pillows, duvets. A lot of interior stuff, what you could use, and insulation. Like yeah, so, yeah. the whole the whole fleece gets used. I'm thinking, right, it's it doesn't get wasted. There is bits where you think, mm. so British will try hard to like break it all up. And the experience what British will have got, what well, once they get their, their their greasy fleece, then grading all it in the different parts, goes down to the spinners. And I think it's a, the good relationship Don and the design team have got with the spinners, is saying, can you do this? Can you do that? And then working on it. Then the spinners speaking to British wool to find out how much wool is in the actual pot. Yeah, we can do that. Now, when you were talking about, um, you've used the term greasy wool a few times. Yeah. Uh, explain what it is for for the viewers. Uh, greasy wool is like when it's easy to tell us when every year the sheep get a haircut. Um, the breeds of sheep that we use only get a haircut like once a year. If you're using like what's very popular now, I don't know if it's in the states yet, is like a phallus black nose. That has to get clipped twice a year, and it's more like a, a pet. But it's, but if you look at the sheep, they get a haircut once a year. It promotes like the welfare of that sheep as well. So, it, so it comes off off the off the sheep. It's it's greasy. So the lanolin in there, there's a product in there as well. The lanolin, it's like it's great moisturizer. So it, it's greasy, like and you can you can feel it like. But then once your kilts before it goes to the finishing plant, you can actually feel. There's a bit of lanolin in there. Although it's been through those other processes being dyed to colour, it's still there. So we call it the greasy. But so greasy just means like essentially untreated, untreated undyed. Yeah. Undried. It's just yeah, like... It's got all the oils, all the lanolin. It's got all the lanolin, lanolin still in it. Yeah. Correct. It's, it's fresh as anything. Like mm -hmm. uh, It's got that smell, that cheap it, smell. It's got that, yeah. It has got a smell. And yeah. so when you go to the sorting office, it is very smelly. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's sheep, there's some sheep that are like, needing a haircut and the, the, the wool's no great and it's like mm, but they've got a purpose yeah and it's like but then some of them are really nice they don't get they look like the hairdresser they get a shampoo and set They're, they get <laughs> yeah. twigs and bugs yeah. yeah but then something if you look in some of our like Scottish wool there is bits of fibre in there and it's like you don't get that in some other other tartans as well and um, we've got a thing in Scotland called bracken yep. it's bracken fern mm -hmm. You take it down Australia. Hmm. Yeah. And what you sometimes find, you get poly, polypropylene, and then you might see like a white thread. That doesn't take up any dye stuffs, and that's just come out of like a certain, certain floor or in the wool shed, and it's got tied in, and it's went through all the processes. 
But it still comes out white. It still comes out white. Yep. So if you get a, like a a kilt and it's got like a oh it's a bit, what's that? It's like a bit of bracken. It, you can't get any more real than that. Yeah. Okay? And it's like the sheep are free to roam in the hills, and it's like you're in the factory. It's like so fortunate being in the borders. It's like the hill opposite the mill. It's full of sheep, and those sheep may end up. The fleeces may end up on our shelves, being sold now, all over the world. <clears throat> I want to know. Yeah. In in the in the the seal industry, I know several years ago they actually said that they mm -hmm. had to actually give a serial number to each yeah. seal that was harvested, so you can actually trace it. So you know you're not you're not just buying illegal seals kind of thing. Now, are we going to be able to get so advanced in our kilt knowledge mm -hmm. and our our, our uh, tartan knowledge? that we can trace the kilt that Keith is wearing to Bessie and Susie, the two sheep that live on the hill behind the shop. Mm. Not quite, <laughs> right? But if you could say, right, it goes to the sorting office, they make him trace that batch. Give to you a particular farmer. Yeah, uh, right. the farmer. When yeah. it comes to the wool sorting office, um, like when you go to the builder's yard and you get a dumpy bag off aggregate, yeah, you get them. Like an aggregate bag? Yeah. Like a dumpy bag? Yeah. If yeah. you, you can imagine that, twice the size of that, rammed full of fleeces, it'll come from, there'll be a, a, a batch number on that, and it'll come from, well, the picture is what you saw in the, the little video clip there. That's Fernley Farm, and that's like three miles of crow flies from the factory. And it's farmed by the Macomb family. I know the dad and son play rugby. And it's like very hands on family. You saw them at the clipping in there. It's like everybody's mucking in there. So the, um, the wife and the daughter, everybody's in there like and mucking in, doing their stuff. It's three miles from the factory. So it's telling a story there as well. Like, so you can see it's from the Macomb family and you know the welfare of that animal has been, is bang on. Yeah, sheep have the identif identification tags on their ears, but you don't have any in their fleece. You'll just have, a, it'll be a batch I know. of that farm. Um, but you know, if it's got to come from the south of Scotland, you can't have got any far wrong with the scenery we've got. Like, and it's like cross like three miles for the factory, or you can drive thirty miles up a valley, and it's like, look at this! Like, you've got the locks, you've got blue sky, sometimes, and it's you can't go wrong. Like, yeah, apart from the midges. Not enough. <laughs> huh? It's not not enough blue not enough. sky. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now I'm curious. Did the uh, uh, did the pandemic and supply chain disruptions, shall we say, play a part in wanting to do Scottish wool? Mm -hmm. Or what, like I know, you know most 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 wool for for the industry comes from New Zealand and Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so knowing that there was issues with the supply chain mm -hmm. during the pandemic, did was that part of the impetus of of Lockheed and saying, well. Let's let's try to get some more stuff local because that way we don't have to worry about shipping containers. We don't have to worry about this, this, and this. Um, or was it strictly an ecological play? I would say it's supporting like a Scottish woolen industry. Yep. And it's like if it's on your doorstep, you might as well utilize it. And if and it's going back to you use the spinners and it works, the, the pandemic, yeah, it did play a part. Like, but then it played affected everybody. Yeah. Um, unless you were cash rich and had a shed full of wool, <laughs> but don't we all? Well, I know I have three sheds full of wool right yeah. behind the shop. It's uh, I see a, I see a shed. So it's actually a bit like a big warehouse. I call them sheds. <laughs> it's, um, but it'd be good to have that. But then everybody was off, so you could you were sitting with that money sitting in, in your shed. You couldn't get anybody to produce it. So yeah, uh, so. In the lockdown, we ran our, ran our stock downs very low, and that gave us, when we started back up, we kind of drip thread like the British wool at the time into the Strom system. And everything that comes in now is on the, the 218s, 216s, sorry, uh, is 100% wool, and it's 100% Scottish wool. Nice. Yeah. So it's good when you come bring customers around and you go, yeah, that's Those it. Those sheep yeah. made that yeah. tartan over there. Yeah. I have, I have, I have, I have said that line once or twice, like I say, they sheep, there you go. Nice. But it tells a story, and it's like, you can relate to the family, and if it depends what way they come to Selkirk, you're actually passing the farm where yeah. the wool could come from. Yeah. And and the sort, or if they drove past the sorting office, 
It's very, the sort of is really good. In that clipping time of the year, you'll get like a farmer rocking up with his pickup truck with a bale in the back, and that might be his flock of sheep. Or you get somebody coming in with a truck with a whack of bale. Where you go? A whack of a whack. A no, whack official measurement. Right, yes. A whack of bales in the back, like so. Yeah. Um, but th- roughly we go through about a ton, which is a thousand pounds. Aye, pounds. Sure. Yeah. Let's let's assume I know weight measurements. Weight measurements. We go through about a ton a week, but then in the bigger scheme of things, overall, British Scottish wool is thirty percent our market now. Who knows going forward where it'll go? Yeah. And that's just on one quality. Yeah. yeah. It's it's neat, uh, as as someone who who loves good marketing, um, and loves a good story, mm-hmm. um, it's it's neat to be able to add to the the history of clan tartans and the knowledge that is there and the and the 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 pedigree that's there with being able to say and the sheep are from right here and Mm -hmm. the people are from right here it's it tells more of a complete story of the garment than any other garment that i know of like it's they're, they're they're i won't say any period but they're how many how many people know you know where the t-shirt where the cotton for your t-shirt was harvested who picked the cotton who wove the cotton who you know actually made the cotton t- or, or who made the cotton into or the, made the, the material into a t-shirt to sell it to you how many people know that whole dirt to shirt story versus a you know sheep to kilt story mm-hmm. and you know it's 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 a beautiful thing to be able to know this is the land where the sheep was, who got the haircut, who went to that dye house over there, who went to that weaving shed over there, who went to that kilt maker over here, who made it to my exact measurements, and now it's on my body. Hmm. How many people, how many articles of clothing do you know that entire story for? This is, this is one of the few industries where you can actually say, I know every step of the process. And that's pretty freaking cool. Yes. I, I, once you get into it, like, hey, the more passionate you can get, like, hey, and it's like, you don't want to go and bang on the drum, and it's like, then, it is quite, you touching it there, it is, it is a good story, like. Bang the yeah. damn drum, dude. Just uh, bang it away. Um, I don't care. <laughs> That's one thing we do here is we bang drums. Right. Indeed. Mm-hmm. We're like, we are like the Slipknot with, <laughs> with multiple drums. You have no idea what I'm talking I've about. I've heard a Slipknot, yeah. A band? No, oh, I've heard it. That's it. Okay, fair. I've heard it's it, a band right. with a lot of drums. <laughs> right. So, we okay. are the Slipknot of the fashion industry. Banging drums. Yep. Cheers. Eric. You have to Photoshop both of you guys into Slipknot masks now. Exactly. Is that, is that so the ski mask? With the spikes. Like a, they all, they oh, all wear Halloween masks. Yeah, Halloween thing. mask. Yeah. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, rings a bell. Yeah. Good yeah. band. Good band. Because they, aren't, they don't have the guts to actually take the time to put on corpse paint like a proper heavy metal band. But anyway, I digress. Um, Mantra, Mantra Radius 5902 asked... Uh, what are the best and worst dye colors when it comes to their consistency between dye lots, longevity of how they look over time? You know, what's better or worse for fading? Mm-hmm. Um, are there certain colors that you tend to work with or tend to avoid for any reason? And uh, there's, a lot, there, there's someone else, similar question, very curious about whether natural dyes are ever used anymore or if it's all synthetic aniline dyes. So right. a little bit about dyes. Technical question. <laughs> I've been, I've been dying oh, to no, hear your answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, sorry for everyone at home. Don't, don't change. You'll probably find camel's quite a hard color to dye because if it, it's really it, camel, look, so like tan. Kind tan. Of, I'll yeah. look at something and they say, "Oh, it's too red." I'm thinking, is it? But then but you start looking at it. If you ask, like, speak at the designers when they come and like look at the colors. You can actually see where they're coming from, so they're trained to look for that as well. We don't use any fluorescent colours, so that would be too much. Like um, a kilt um, from the eighties, boys and girls. It could, if, if you want, we'll make one. Not with a no, hair. no, no, no. Hair no. Don't Mitchell. put that idea no. into anyone's no. head out there. No, he no. won't. I'm taking that back for him. Yeah. Do not Photoshop. Actually, do Photoshop an eight nineteen eighties fluorescent color kilt right here. Oh dear um, God! Yes, yep. you're welcome, everyone. A lot of this dye stuffs they're all color fast, like so. They they shouldn't really fade unless yep. you look after them well. Um, what we have found 
since a lot of the, the components in the dies have changed. So instead of us like buying it off the shelf, the colour from our suppliers, um, we've, had, we've had Brexit in the UK, mm. and a lot of things what we can't do, and maybe we've changed it in Europe, and it doesn't work with us. So they may have changed the component in the actual dye stuff. So we've been buying like that shade of dye, and we start to make it, and it's like, oh, it's not the same color. So you're thinking, all oh, right. So, so they don't even tell you that they've like, hey, this no. thing, this particular chemical became illegal. Therefore, we had to change this particular we've changed shade. It. No, you did get that. Uh, so you're like back to square one. So if you think, oh, crikey, that's not working. So I think I'd have it with the freaking uh, dyers. But then, so Fiona is our dyer, and she goes in and like gets mixes it up and t t tries a bit of this and a bit of that to try and get it to the recipe what we've used to use all the time it might only take a little bit a little bit or something else and it's bang on again but it just right. takes a little bit it's no straightforward yeah and but just, do you find out before you weave the cloth I oh hope. yeah yeah good, good so good. When, when it comes to dyeing obviously we'll buy the wool in white it comes in a like a a two pound cone and we all dye it from we dye it like in a big pressure vessel so it goes in a, a spike you think a whiskey vat with spikes. You put the cones into there. And we've got another pressure vessel behind that. There's my hands walking, talking again. We all, do it all the time, we'll fill this up with the, the powdered dye and hot water. So after a while, we start pumping it through. So we dye it from the inside out. So right. it gets a consistency all the way through the cone. You usually could dye it like on, on like loose dye. Or if you're like doing like a mixture, you, you dye it in the loose. Like of like just wool fluff, right? So we'll dye on we dye on the cone. So you're you're talking about dyeing the wool mm -hmm. fluffy no. versus yeah versus on a cone on already cone. spun. Yeah. So it's it's actually yarn, and yeah. then you're dyeing the yarn. So we're dyeing the yarn on the cone, yeah. um, and it usually takes about two hours from start to finish. But Fiona and, and Lewis that works in the dyes. They're trained to look at the colors and match them up, and we've also we've got little tails floating about in the dyes. So after maybe a couple hours, we'll take it out and go check it against the master shade. Yeah, yeah. So it's like somebody sitting at Ford and making sure the red in every Ford car going through is, is the right red, shade of red. That shade of red. The no, cherry red, red not the, red, no the BMW apple red. red. Yeah. Right? So the checking is that. If it needs a bit longer or tweak a little bit, tweak, they can tweak it in the dye pot. Once it's out, it's settled, dried, then it goes through the next process in the factory. Right. But dye stuff is... I know a, a problem all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, no, you want to, you want to be consistent from A to B to yeah. C. You know, you want your all of your products to be consistent across time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think about the the Brexit aspect complicating the whole freaking thing mm -hmm. of the the dyes that you're using because you're right. Why why would it ever be different? You just call up the company who sells you your dye. I need blue nine seven six. Yeah. Send me blue nine seven six. Boom, done. Um, mm -hmm. Why would that ever change? So yeah, that's. Ugh, I kind of hate that. I that, imagine that that part, causes right? a lot of a lot of mm -hmm. issues. I from from sitting on this side, um, you know, where we just get mm -hmm. the kilts or no, excuse me, get the fabric and the and the the fabric is always consistent yeah. coming from the different mills. I don't think about all that goes into it, but you know, uh, every every single business has its own supply mm -hmm. chain issues, and you know, it's it has to work. You know, from from you know step zero, all the way through to the finished garment, and there are, there are so many checks and so many balances. I it's, hmm, I never thought about the Brexit hmm. thing affecting it yeah. and what your problems are going into it. So I feel bad for you. Hmm. That's that sounds horrible. It's uh, it's testing, challenging, Aye, yeah, challenging, and up keeping it right as well. Like and when it goes into the ovens, it's set there like so. Uh, camels are worse than we die, and even black as well. You think black will be okay, but black is not black. It's is no, not black. It's no. Like a, no, it's no. But you see, if you want to <laughs> get stressed sometimes, when you are, like you take some of the colours and you can. But then we're quite lucky. We've got a really high tech uh, system. We've got like filing cabinets with the recipes. So every piece of yarn that we've dyed in the past, we'll take like a, a wrapping off of that. It's attached to it, and when it was done, so we've got the master shade. Then we've got every one after that, and when we did it, and what many kilos we've dyed, so it's not going to go way out. It may go out a little bit, but you can always go back to the master. You can always go back to the master, yep. and once it's done there, we've got like a, a light box, 
So we can like look at under different kind of lights to make sure okay. it is showing up the right colour. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, it's just a big light box. There is a, a technical. I'll send Rocky a picture of the the technical explanations down one side of it. It's it's in Scottish terms, uh, but no. A lot it, of explicatives. It does work <laughs> like anything. All right, never look at it. Then you look at it there, and you go look under natural light, like you look at it in like normal light. And you think mm. you take it outside, and it's much and you look at in the light box yeah, under yeah. natural light and it changes completely mm -hmm. and it's just like probably <clears throat> something probably two yards by a yard wide this box you can change the lights on there and it's it, it's worth yeah um, when when you look at um spirit of scotland tartan yeah in you know in a in a regular room with like cool white you know mm -hmm. fluorescent lighting yeah. it looks you know, dark, you can't, it's very, very subtle changes. Mm -hmm. You can't see much. Mm -hmm. If you take that outside in natural daylight, you, that purple yeah. pops, that electric blue pops, and you can you can really see the, the design mm. that's there. So, yeah. And what we find very hard sometimes as well is if somebody's replacing like their higher stock, and obviously the things have changed now, and we're using Scottish wool as opposed to what we've used in the past. It might be slightly different, like in there, the downside is with that is they're trying to match them with all their jackets and then they're higher. So if we put like weave cloth and it's it's slightly different, yeah, it will stand out in a big higher range. But in time, the higher the old higher range goes that yeah, way. Yeah, it gets shifted. Through. And it's we're not going to change again. Like so, we we're we're not going to walk away from the Scottish wool side of things. It will always be there now. Till I retire, and probably you will then too. There. Yeah. <laughs> So, I'm not retiring until I die. I'm going to kick over in this chair live on camera. I need ratings, boys and girls. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, in his slipknot mask. <laughs> there you go. Um, Indeed. In my slipknot mask. You guys have rabbit holed a little yes. a lot. Sorry. But I have so, to ask two questions or one, one observation and one question. Um, I'm fascinated that as much of the process actually still relies on human eyesight. Mm -hmm as opposed to using like a spectrometer or something to, yeah. to say, okay, this is the number of molecules here. We know this is the correct mm -hmm. rate because the science says so. Um, but my question is, you mentioned that you guys wind up homebrewing the formulas for some of the dyes to make sure they're correct. Does that become a trade secret? I can't tell you that. <laughs> yeah. That's no, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. If you'd get past few in, a, in the dye house and in the, in the filing cabinet, you might find the recipe. <laughs> So. She, has, she has a bat with spikes sticking out of it just uh, in case she likes her heavy rock bands so you, you could talk about bands and maybe get in around that fair. way fair okay yeah. okay right, right. Yeah. okay That's but good. no it's i don't think it's a trade secret like but then everybody's got their own uniqueness mm -hmm. from our weathers to others like old and rare or muted colors they all go through the same processes but they're slightly tweaked they might they might add a little bit of that dye to make it more relevant to their market and we'll mm -hmm. keep it to our market mm -hmm. yeah you gotta have an identity yeah as a mill yeah mm -hmm. okay cool thank you um speaking of things you guys do that may or may not be rational carl taylor asks why did le Caron decide that the aberdeen tartan should be 23 inch size set yeah keith <laughs> i'll take a wee drink for this one All right i know that <laughs> it's it's quite a nice tartan isn't it Is the kilt maker's nightmare, right? A tartan with a twenty. You now, when 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 a kilt maker is making a kilt, we need to you know fold the pleats mm -hmm. into each other to make sure that you have you know just a little bit showing. And if you're doing it to the set, you want the pattern to progress along the pleats. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is most most normal sane mills will choose a seven or eight inch set size for their tartans because that you know equals a good amount of fabric to tuck into the pleat, a good size face, and it creates a nice a nice mm -hmm. kilt. If you have a mill who goes rogue, who's <laughs> just, you know, they're, they're, they're smoking too much in the back room in the mill and decide, hey guys, you know what I want? 23 inch set size, man. Um, and they decide that a 23 inch set size for the Aberdeen tartan is the thing to do. All kilt makers want to kill them. Yeah. We've had issues with people buying swatches. So you get a swatch, a swatch is like a nine inch piece of fabric. And depends how it's cut, you may get the white bit, you may get the red bit. I didn't or... even think about the swatch size. Right, you may get a bit what's, a bit of both and you're thinking, right. So. We dig a bit of history. Looking at that, 
Wilson's of Bannockburn, the original go-to. Yeah, yeah. We've the set size what they had had yeah is almost identical what we do. So we've just <gasps> followed followed them. So I'm sorry, Wilson's of Bannockburn. You're being thrown under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, well, they're, they don't exist. They're, they're all dead, dead now. Yeah. But I think I think our strobe is about 28 inches. It's a big set. It's big. It's big. It's surprising that it does no bad throughout the year. Bale wise, it probably do a bale hmm. a year. Well, there's a lot of a lot of family names yeah. linked to Aberdeen, okay. so yeah. I it is one of the. But then, if you look at Black Watch, is a big set as well. Technically, yes, yeah, but usually it's, it's, people plead it to the half aye. set, not the full you didn't set. Didn't notice it, but then you yeah, start looking at anything. Aberdeen, you can kind of notice. It is. Yeah, but then, aye. Aberdeen, Brisa Kinnaird, um, Dundee Old. They're quite... Dundee Old is a beautiful target. It is. I really love it's that It's quite one. undermarketed. It really is. And the, the two shades of red and the mm -hmm. orange in there, it's yeah. chef's kiss. That's a beautiful one. Yep. Okay. So, but we're... So, do you know why they originally did it? And or, we can go a different direction. Mm -hmm. Less less uncomfortable for you for making horrible decisions in the past. Well, at least the mill did. Um, what what is the ration the current rationale if you're going to design a new tartan now yeah what set size would La Karen see as kind of ideal what are you aiming for in a set size for a particular tartan it's a if trap you're designing it today it's a trap it's a trap <laughs> uh, whatever the kilt maker say sir yeah uh, seven inches seven seven okay. hmm. good it works okay. uh, and but then some you try to make sure if somebody designs their own time, we'll try and make sure it starts and finishes in the right bit. So if you look, uh, it's, you can't blue is quite an awkward one because it doesn't non-matching, yeah. non-matching, and you've not got like a, a set or one if like you follow. So we'll kind of maybe tweak it around with the customer's consent to say, look, if you try it this way, it'll, it will be, it will work from side to side. Yeah. Um, then it's trying to work like where you put your 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 tucking edge. You've got to go, but if you move this about, it'll, it'll work better instead of having like your white line right along the edge. There's a lot of step, but seven inches is kind of your go-to set size. <coughs> if somebody wanted to, I think you can you can blow them up to even bigger, like. But then it's more of a fashion product then on accessories. But if you keep your your kilt seven inches, or if you go like your, your reaver fabric will go smaller, just because it's more. But they're used for small, yeah, for smaller garments, garments and things yeah. like that. But kilt weight. Seven inches is roughly yeah. right. It's it's amazing. The uh, speaking as as someone who has designed, you know, several tartans myself, and who makes finished kilts mm -hmm. in those things, it's amazing the amount of things that you need to think about or you should be thinking about when you're designing a tartan, all the way through to you know what the finished garment is going to look like. There's a huge breadth of things, and and there there are not many people that do like this is not meant to sound self-congratulatory for the record but there's not many people that do what we do there's a lot of people that'll design tartans and then there's kilt makers there's not a lot of people who do both mm -hmm. um so if you're a fashion house or a design you know, a designer designing a tartan or even if you're an individual designing your own tartan for yourself you're thinking about what looks pretty and what looks good and what you have you know, what your tastes are versus how difficult it's going to be for a kilt maker to pleat an asymmetrical mm -hmm. thing versus a symmetrical one. Or if this white line and the lines around it are too narrow, but you want to have it pleated to the stripe, yeah. but you're going to have spikes on the back of the kilt because the lines are too close to the edge of where the pleats are going to be. There's like all these different things that kind of go into it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about how the mills think about doing their own designs, how much, because you're just weaving the cloth, mm -hmm. How much do you think about the kilt makers? We, we can look at it as well, because we, we've recently invested in a new design program. And you can look at it in a bigger picture. Instead of working like an A4 card, it's, it's went like in the 21st century. It's, it's like, whoa. And like once you get some new designs done, you'll actually see it. It's like, you can actually see what it's got to look like. Instead of having hmm. one set, you've actually got to go. Do you do like, like and this is a serious question. Do you do like the big blueprint? Tiles, you know, type things or no? Yeah. Okay, so big right. enough. It's big enough, like yeah, so yeah, you yeah. can actually see the repeat unless yeah. it's Aberdeen. 
Well, uh, I'd probably yeah. add three together. Or the, Common, or the recent Commonwealth Games one with that huge... Which was... We, we wove that, and it was like, because it was done like in an asymmetric, it, we had to like turn it. And it was like looking at it, and with Siobhan, the designer, came down to the factory and she, looking at it, and she went, I don't think that's right. I'm like, what do you mean? Because <laughs> she designed it, we did it on a card, then she was designing the garment. So she looked at the garment side of things. Then we looked at the weaving side of things. So Leslie and her design team and Siobhan spoke and they went, she she, were, she saw where Siobhan was coming from. Siobhan then realised, and it works. Yeah. And, but looking at it from a bit of paper to a, the on the loom thing. was like, that's not quite. But then it does, you just have to turn it. And it was perfect. Like, it's quite fortunate because we got the, the best dressed um, team in the Commonwealth Games. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's quite good. And it was, oh, it was good to see that, like, something that we'd wove using Scottish wool. Yeah. On the main stage. Yeah. yeah and it, it does. Yeah. And I think we recently done the UCI World Mountain Bike Championships, which is up in one of the local forests near us. So we've done the UCI Mountain Bike Tartan as well. Nice. And so. Good stuff. Yep. All right, Eric. Uh, we have a few people asking if there are our tours of the Lacaran Mill by any chance. There is Mill Tours. Um, Steal some cloth for me if you go. If you're coming back to the States and you don't want to pay shipping, just put rocky stuff into your bag like that. No, uh, Mill Tours, we do Mill Tours Monday to Thursday. Um, we're quite fortunate, production don't work a Friday unless you are very lucky and there's some weaving on, you might get into the mill on a Friday. Um, but usually Monday to Thursday, um, we do probably three or four tours a day. You can just rock up or can phone up and make an appointment then if you're really unfortunate you'll get me to take you around the factory and listen to me talking and shouting at you over the machinery I get a whack <laughs> of stuff like so you get and um and in the sheds but you it's, it's a good way of actually seeing and realizing one how things start from like a to b then you realize like the value of the product it is oh that's why it's it's not a cheap product but you get to realize Let's say there's 16 processes in the weaving shed. Once it goes to the finishing, there's probably mm. another 16 to 20 processes, which we don't see. Then it comes back to like the cutting bench. Then you've got the, like, Mikey and Mark, and look at the team that does all the cutting. They're handling it, then it goes to the... So it's all hands-on it's shipped, stuff. It's then shipped. it's customs, then it's the kilt maker. Yep. yep. There's lots goes into it, like, but mill tours, you get... We've got like a small... Uh, we bit of history about tartan and some of the what we kind of touched on earlier the day. Some of the design pieces customers that we work with, the sustainability side of things, wool, the environment, all that, into the weaving shed. And it's kind of we've got the weaving trail, so it goes like the dye house, the warping winding, into the down to the, the, the looms, and you got, you'll see two different kind of looms. We've got the the, the summits, sorry, the saucers. And I've said there are two, it's Dorniers now, we've changed them. We've got Dorniers are new, then we've got the Smiths, which is in the new looms at the very bottom. You'll see all them working, doing different weaves, maybe a fashion cloth in the, the Dorniers, and, and you might see Buchanan and Blue getting woven in the bottom looms, into the darning. And a lot of people in the factory will interact with you, you ask them a question, they'll run away and hide. They'll, they'll tell you how it is, which is great. Sometimes you think, oh my god, but it's all right. Then in the warehouse, don't so, talk to him. Yeah, but people they want to tell their story because <clears throat> we've all got a passion for what we're doing, and just seeing it out there, like yeah. Now that's that's one thing. Again, this this whole industry, the people who are in this industry, love what they do. There's there's there aren't a whole lot of people who are just lackadaisical of like. Yep, gotta go weave heritage cloth today. Mm. All right, fine, it's a paycheck. Yeah. The people that, you know, in that, that I've met in the industry, the people that I've met at the, you know, at the mills, the people that, in, you know, the people that we hire in this building, you know, whether it's a camaraderie within the building and within the team, mm -hmm. or if, if it's camaraderie or if it's a, a passion for the actual material and the heritage, or it's a passion for, you know, made in Scotland, mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of overflowing passion within, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're quite uh, even with fortunate. We really we've got a, a good connection in Edinburgh. Um, she's got a little shop, and she gets like like private tours. Like say you've got some American family want to come down and visit the borders, and it's one of those places. It's like a wee hidden gem. There's no much. A lot of people think go north, L- love the history, love the scenery, but it's a weird feeling. Like say you come over the, the English border and you look, you stand at the top of the Carter Bar, which is like the border between. England and Scotland, and you're looking down on the borders like you're thinking, I'm quite lucky. Um, and it's like, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm a bit softy sometimes. When I'm coming like from some of my trips, I'll put on, no slip, not I'll put on scary war tide lines. My wife will go, what, what are you listening to? I just listen to it in the car, like, and it's like, it's good music because you, you feel as you're coming home. Although it being away, this will be different from being away. I'm coming to the states, so I've got it in my car, so I'll be all right going back to New York tomorrow. I'll put that on. Some home. There, there's yeah. There, there's uh, what's it? Uh, the uh, uh, the phrase. There's there's no patriot like an expatriate, mm-hmm. or there's you yeah. know the kilts are worn by Americans in Scotland and by Scots in America. Mm-hmm. It's the number of Scots that I've met that either live here or travel here or are here for an extended period of time who say like I've I've never appreciated where I came from mm-hmm. until I was here and saw how much other people yeah. appreciated what I have. Mm-hmm. And wow, like it, it kind of it give, it gives you that mirror to to look at, look at yourself and mm-hmm. look at your own culture. And be like, wow, it really is beautiful here. Yep. It really is a beautiful country. Yep. I really am lucky to be able to have sheep as neighbors. Yep. <laughs> if you look at the song, it's like my borderland. And the words to that, it just sums up what we've got, and we're pretty damn lucky. Uh, yeah. Um, aye, it's good. Agreed. Eric. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Um. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. A couple of history questions here, which I you can interbraid if you want to. Uh, Kevin Stone and yours truly. Cool. Uh, we were wondering how far back did the records of the mill go? And I'm thinking in terms of like earliest orders, how the mill got started in the first place. Kevin is wondering: Is there a physical archive of woven samples of tartan? I mean, other than what we're talking about with thread, uh, yeah. dye thread, but you know, of woven samples of actually uh, tartan. Yes and no. We are really bad at keeping records, old records. It is, we look at the archives and you're thinking, we've got a couple of boxes. Um, I don't know if it's like being part of like a family company and just things getting diluted into, into cupboards and forgot about. But there's no like a, a room where you could walk in and it's like the history of Locarno. And it's like what we've found. We have got ledgers going back through acquisitions of company and like, like, early 30s but we've got, we've got stuff like going we can we, we kind of pin down the actual date to be 1890 we've got history going back to that but then a series of acquisitions of companies over the years we get a little bit but the history with the company that we've bought may have some didn't stuff they, themselves didn't they come with the company yeah and we bought bought the name but we didn't buy all the archives the records yeah um but we know locarno itself is a little village in Wester Ross. It was started up after the war due to a family connection with the Buckin family. Um, and the first piece of cloth that they wove was Crawford. And we, we can't put a specific a specific date on when we started weaving our tartan range. There isn't okay. any record of that, which is a bit sad nowadays. But everything that we do now um, is documented and uh, we took a swatch off the cloth. Um, we had one last week. One of my like suppliers in the kilt industry phoned me. He's like, I've sent you a picture. Can you identify the tartan? I'm thinking, right. So we're quite lucky. Iona works with side me and Kev. If you can't get the tartan identified between the three of us, like, we're like, well. And we go, it looks like a Mackay, but it's not a Mackay. And I went, right. So when I first started doing the cloth cutting, I always kept like a, a ring binder under my, under my table. And it's still there, right? So yep. if you're doing a special, it gets an S number. I thought, so I went back and it's like S26, special Mackay in the customer's name. And it was that. So it's like, that was going back to the early 2000s. But then we have got stuff into the early 80s. So I'm thinking, right, we can find it. If it's something really old, um, we can probably replicate it, but we wouldn't have like a woven sample of that. 
Right. If you could provide us with it, we'll match it. But history is a bad thing. <coughs> so what we're, we're trying now is, um, we've recently acquired through ex-family members of the company, they had a lot of Vivian Westwood pieces and fashion pieces. Oh, cool. We had a, an office in London, and I think they were all based in, like, London was the place you went and met these customers. Right. They didn't come this way. Yeah. You always went down. And they had it, so we've acquired that again, so we have got a lot of vintage pieces. And we're, they're in um, clear bags, hanging up within a, a suit carrier. So we know on that side of things we've got stuff yeah it's yeah. it's difficult um uh, even in our usa kilts short 21 year history um it is it's difficult looking back we have we have specific things um leftover pictures whatever from the the first few years in business but when you're in it and you're doing it you're not thinking Oh, this thing is gonna last mm -hmm. fifty years, a hundred years. I need to catalog. I need to document my steps to the process. Mm -hmm. What you're thinking is, oh shoot, this guy's order got screwed up. Okay, I gotta do this. I gotta do this tomorrow. I gotta answer these emails. I gotta build the website. You're thinking about every single little tiny detail. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about the big long picture. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky enough that I still have, um, like a picture of the first shop that we were in, as well as Kelly. Uh, kudos to her was smart enough when they tore down that little cottage that we first started in she took one of the stones from that cottage and we mm -hmm. actually have that in the store but it's 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 a shame that more founders don't know when they're in it like they can't forecast to the future yeah. and see a hundred years into the future if we could we'd be much richer okay. <laughs> but it, we can't see it and say that we're not thinking about it in the moment now I will say you missed an opportunity there, sir. What you should have said was that Blair McNaughton snuck into <laughs> La Caron. McNaughton's yeah. like the, the, pre, the parent company of, uh, of House of Edgar. Blair McNaughton, here, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fix it for you. The reason, the real reason why La Caron doesn't have any of their old records. Blair McNaughton, dressed as a ninja, snuck into La Caron in the middle of the night and fought. <laughs> <laughs> with Alistair Buchan, you know, Highlander style. There could be only one. Alistair escaped Jeez. barely with his life. <laughs> but Blair took Lockheron's records. <sighs> and that son of a bitch. Bloody and bastard. he he took them and destroyed Lockheron's covenant. That is what gave them their power. That was the Samson. That was the hair of Samson that gave Lock Heron their power. <laughs> they almost destroyed Lock Heron. But the records have begun to accumulate again. And through time, through, through luck, through th sheer will of fortitude and grit, Lock Heron has clawed their way back from the edge. And Blair McNaughton mm. is no more. So we the Percy Jacksons now? I don't know. I, I, I'm just going way off the rails. Somebody get the hook. That's, that's yeah. the second whiskey talking. But no, it's um, like you never know something. If you're like in a, a charity shop something, and you're looking for you may find a Wilson's or Bannock Burn book. No, what would you do with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thank yeah. Very much. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, it, it speaks to the broader, the broader thing of mm -hmm. you don't know the good times when you're in the good times. Well, don't know this. You know that you're going through a thing and you're just, you're just going through the motions and then 20, 30 years later, you look back and be like, man, I wish I would have done that. Yeah. Not many of us have the foresight to think mm -hmm. in the moment, this is the thing I need to catalog. This is the thing that's going to be important. This is the story um, until it's too late. So hopefully <laughs> that's part of why we do these videos is to be able to catalog these things, mm -hmm. both for the company, for the industry, for our friends like Keith, all of it to be able to say, this is how it was in our time. This mm. is why these things happen. This is how these things happen. These are our stories, and this is how we're telling it going forward. Yeah. Indeed. You're here. Cheers. Eric. Uh, Rocky, uh, TGF42193 thinks you should get into doing children's novels. He thinks you have a future as a adventure storyteller. Yeah. 
Fair. Mm-hmm. King Charles likes kids books. I was about to say, uh, speaking of friends, uh, Peter J. Hutchinson, friend of the channel, mentioned that our, our mutual good, very close good friend, King Charles III, visited the mill. How was his majesty taking, uh, how has his majesty taking an interest in tartan and highland dress benefited the industry, in your opinion? Uh, and was there any favorite moment during that visit? Right. I think uh, King Charles and Camilla, King Queen when they came around the factory, mm -hmm. it was very hush hush for a good couple of months. Um, before that, because there was um, some very tall gentlemen in suits turning up to the factory, looking very suspicious. And you like, imagine like G.I. Joe, where they, you could move their, their eyes with moving the, like a little switch at the back of their head. Yeah. They were like looking at everything and what was going on, walking around the factory and the guys of a tour. You know, who are they? So it's like, then gradually it came out, people were asking well, what's happening and are we getting a visit? And I went, mm, I don't know. But it coincided with the visit of the Great Tapestry of Scotland and Gala Shields. Queen Camilla was meant to open that. Unfortunately, the late Queen passed away about the same time, so that was mothballed. So she came into it then. Then it was technically a private visit, so it wasn't on the radar of uh, some of the big wigs what go along to these things because the power of the visitors what we had. So it was kind of a low key, but then it came out. Um, and it's kept straight in the weaving shed, like, and he engaged with most people all around the factory, and it was like quite daunting. Um, thinking, that's the king there, like, yeah, and then it's like, he's it's, it's there, like, yeah. And there was people came down to see him, like, and it was like, right. Um, my niece at the time was more excited seeing the, the, the sniffer dogs because she didn't become a vet, so she's more interested about the, how the dogs became, how they, they do it. Um, so they are dog people. That does speak highly of them. Yep. That they are dog people. I don't trust non-dog people. But no, it was good. Um, and it tied in with doing, going back to the Heron Bone Salvage Kilt through Peter McDonald and John McLeish. They were promoting that. And us using like Scottish wool was a big plus point for him to visit the factory. Um, we've been fortunate in the past to have visits from Princess Anne previously. Like, And I was like, right, it's an opportunity he would be daft not to take it, like, so we took it, like, um, it's quite good to see that once he got his kilt, it was woven, uh, a month or so later, he was wearing it at the Braemar Highland Games, mm. um, and that, same again, you were talking about it, what generates interest in Tartan, the amount of inquiries we got after the picture at Braemar, can we buy that Tartan? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, really, like, it. Uh, you need to ask the permission for the, the main man, like yeah. so. But it, it's like for him promoting Highland dress, Highland dress yeah. campaign for wool, and obviously the work that he does at Dumfries House, which is a total different story. Mm. It's like he's got a passion for things, and he's like he wants to keep them because if you don't keep them, they'll they go away. They'll go away, like so. Yeah, um, it's good. It's generated interest, and it's it's a talking point as well. And you gauge that when visitors come into the factory, they, they must have done their homework as well, because they know we've had a visit, and it's like, all oh, right. And it's like they're walking, oh, you spoke to the king. So when it goes at the Darnan, or Darner's Palm, we'll call her Lady Palmer now, because Palm is, likes to engage with people. Yeah, yeah. And she just speaks, like, like me and Rocky speaking here, it was like, say Rocky was the king, uh-huh. Uh, there was <laughs> no, it was like, um, it was like no nervousness, it's just like normal people yeah, speaking. Yeah. Um, it was good. It was really, it was like, it was like once he went, it was like, <sighs> aye. It was bonkers. But then it was like, we in, got the local ice cream company to come after the, the visit. I think the king was at the road end, there was a queue for the ice cream van. Um, but all the police were quite upset because they had to go to the next venue and then they were getting ice cream. So, <laughs> but it was good and it was a very a, a big sigh of relief, like, and just the press was interested. And, like, our <clears throat> donors back in Korea, like, they were like, because they're very royalist, and they were like, they could, they thought it was amazing that we actually had a visit from somebody that high up. It was yeah. really good. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's love them or hate them. 
the uh, 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 the good that he does for the industry across the board, and the Made in Scotland thing, uh, from uh, cloth to you know the British sheep to you know to sporins and all of it. Mm. Charles is absolutely a the the biggest cheerleader. I don't know if I want a Photoshop of Charles in a cheerleading outfit. I'll leave that oh. up to uh, up to you guys. That's a bit beyond. But, the, yeah, the bounds indeed, of it's, good it's taste, a bit beyond. Sir. Yes, we're, we're we're speaking nicely there now. Um, but he is absolutely a great cheerleader for mm-hmm. the entire industry. Um, he, he he knows how to dress. He knows yeah. what he's doing. He's a very very classy looking dude. Um, for yes, I just call him a dude. You do. Uh, yes, indeed. Dude. That's my Americanism. That's, yeah. that's a high compliment for he, our, for indeed. us. Indeed, he's he's a very very classy looking guy, and mm-hmm. he knows how to you know to dress in Highland and Highland attire. He knows what he's doing. He's he's definitely a staunch supporter a, mm-hmm. a supporter of the industry. He's yeah. He he's done a, a lot of good. For the industry yep. so and really fortunate because most visits royal visits maybe like 15 20 minutes they're in and out yeah i think it was in the factor of about an hour and 20 and it was like jeez i'm like oh, crack it but then if you work out all the processes he spoke to everybody in each process so yeah it was good yeah was, he, uh, he, he has a he has a genuine curiosity and yeah. a genuine love for this stuff Mm -hmm. so i'll give him that like it's the reason why he was there for an hour and 20 minutes is because he really wants to understand Mm -hmm. how the cloth is made and what the process is he does have a a thirst for knowledge Mm -hmm. within this stuff Uh, it's good it was a really enjoyable day but it was it was enjoyable seeing the lead up to it as well and it was like we never slapped everything with fresh secret service a fresh tin of paint it was nothing like that it's a working factory we opened the big door um then you could see there was like the boxes had some dust on. You opened the big door and all the wind blew the dust. But then it's a factory. It's no yeah. like a. It's a factory tour. It's not a, yeah. you know, yeah. Aye. But no, it was good. Really, really good. Like, so. And yeah, it was a good lift for the company as well. Like, obviously, what's all happened in the past to see like the 10 year journey from where Betton taken over 11 years ago, taken over to where we are. Yeah, from the brink like, of ruin. To royal yeah. visit is a pretty and, pretty hell of a story yeah. arc. And getting new, did the new looms come in? I think the new looms came in just after the visit because we had to put the visit, we had to put the looms back a bit because either that there was going to be a one of the old looms flying about in midair on top of a crane. Um, <laughs> Let's was, not crush King so like, Charles with the looms. So we had to kind of put that <laughs> a bit back. But then it was like, no, it's it's been really good, and the whole company got a lift and the town because they came out, they did a bit in the town centre after, like so. For Selkirk, 5,000 people, 6,000 people. For the king to be there most of the morning. So yeah. bad, like. Yeah, yeah. Man. Interesting. Yeah. Eric. Uh, it is 4.54. Not sure how much longer you want to go. All right. We'll do a question or two. Okay. I do want to get this one in a little bit. I think you've already touched on this topic, but I think this is important to underscore what we were saying earlier about the industry. Scott Sanders uh, said, not stating any company in particular. However, what are Keith's thoughts on knockoff kilts? That is to say, those who are selling products without permission or weave certain tartans like Isle of Sky uh, without authorization and uh, products coming from certain areas overseas. Let's, let's, let's parse this into two things. Thoughts on uh, uh, import kilts. Import meaning yeah. like Pakistani acrylic yeah cheaper kilts and then the second half is companies or individuals or whatever that will rip off not that i'm biased at all but rip off those scumbags a particular design like isle of sky or someone who takes someone's intellectual property and then just kind of hey we're going to do this one too Mm -hmm. without permission right which one do you want to start on Save the best one to last. Dude. Hot seat. Like, no, I want to do. I, do. I want to do one right. more. I want to do the, uh, the single width. The, the cheap, <clears throat> the cheap kilts, the the, the lookalike kilts, aren't they quite there? Yeah, there is a place for them, but it's it's no true. You, you, they get called kilts, but when you look at what's actually in them, there's there's not that much to it. It's just a couple. It's of a yards. pleated garment. It's a pleated yeah. garment. It's not even a kilt. But then if you were looking to see where we a stag do or it was going to get ruined in one thing or you wanted to do, you wanted to walk in the Highlands, 
try it. Way or right. Something. Yeah. Or it comes to a price point, you need it for an event, you, you don't know what to spend a whack of money on getting something made to measure. And it is a lot of money to get something in the full outfit. And you don't know what to start. It's maybe a starting point, or if you're, say you were um, growing quite a bit, stick it on with that, and it gives you a starting point. If you've got to grow two feet the next year, then you buy a kilt. Just buy something you can almost throw away after it or hand yeah. it down to somebody else. But it is there, there is a market for it, but it is quite annoying sometimes when you think, you see them and you think people are like buying them thinking, oh, that's not really a kilt, but it's a tourist trap thing as well. Like so, but Anywhere in the world you go, you'll find touristy things saying, like, you'll find a, a New York key ring. Where does that come from? Yeah. And you'll find, anywhere in the world, I was really naive last time I was here, I bought Lego, the New York skyline. I'm thinking you can just buy it here. I went to the Lego shop in Edinburgh. Oh, you can buy it there as well. Like so, but it's Lego's Lego. Like, but then you can get cheaper yeah. Lego. Yeah. But, um, no, you're 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 right. You make a valid point. Of it's it's for there are certain things that are either um, now I'm I, the way I'm phrasing this. I'm talking about if you go to Scotland, if you're in Edinburgh on the Royal Mile, or if you're in a, a tourist type of shop in a city center in a big city in in mm. you know Scotland it's it is a and what is the expectation of the tourist who's walking through yeah. what do they want I'm in Scotland I want to buy a kilt and do they want to spend a lot of money on it no cuz I'm going to buy this kilt for my cousin or for my nephew or for my daughter or for or for my son or for mm. whatever so they don't want to spend a lot of money on it <clears throat> so they're just the expectation is low and the price has to be low mm -hmm. to make a sale on it at all. Are they going to walk into, you know, uh, uh, a, a high end kilt shop on the Royal Mile and drop down, you know, five, six, seven hundred pounds on an eight yard wool kilt? Probably not yeah. if it's a gift for somebody else or if it's just a, you know, if they're buying it on a whim. If you're buying something on a whim, there's a certain price point associated with that whim before it becomes painful or before you need a lot of whiskey in order to make the purchase. So I agree it serves mm -hmm. a purpose for the tourist trade in yeah. Scotland and, and in, a, in a parallel way, it serves a purpose for the entry level of the market mm -hmm. here in the diaspora, whether it's Canada, Australia, New Zealand, whether it's the US, wherever it is, there are certain segments of the audience who want a mm -hmm. kilt but can't afford a kilt, so I'm gonna buy the thing I can afford and then it's, as we refer to it, it is a gateway drug. It is the way into the entire mm. thing. It's the first toe in the water of your heritage. And once you buy that and you wear it a couple of times and you realize, hey, this is kind of fun. This is cool. And the more you get engaged mm -hmm. with your own heritage, the more you look into it, the more you research, the more you say, you know what? I'm going to buy my own family tartan. I'm going to buy a proper Scottish, you know, Scottish wool material for my kilt. I'm going to buy a, a, a real kilt, not the less expensive kilt. You know, I want one that's hand sewn or I want one that has, you know, it's a full eight yards. It's not, you know, four yards of acrylic material, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Does that make so, sense? Yep, it does. Even like we look at some of the, the lambs old products like scarves and blankets on sale in the mile, there's a wide variety and a lot of the tartans get like, let's say Bruce Kinnaird, you might find Bruce Kinnaird for Fifteen pounds for a scarf. You might see it for twenty pounds. You might see it for thirty pounds. But you, you get super savvy shoppers now. They're actually looking at the brand and taking a photo of it, reading the label, and finding out where it's from. So it's filtering through. They're actually looking to see one where it's come from. Price points will be all different, and like, all right, I know what it is, and they may buy that. Now, do do you guys have the same? Um, laws in Scotland that we have in the US of, you know, it needs to have the, the made in blank. Mm -hmm. So is it made in the UK, made in China, made in uh, Pakistan, yeah. made in, in India? A lot of products will have, like your kilt fabric will be woven in Scotland. If it's a tie, it may have made in, U made in the UK. Understood. But when you, when you if I'm walking into a, a shop on the Royal Mile, mm -hmm. okay, if I grab a scarf off the rack and turn it over, is it going to say the country of origin? Is that legally have to be there? Or 
Is it going to, like, Loch Karen is going to mm -hmm. say, obviously, made in Scotland. Yeah. Because you're very proud of that fact. If it is not made in Scotland, if it's mm -hmm. one of the Gold Brothers things and it's made in, in Pakistan or made yeah. in India or whatever, is it, if you flip it over, is it going to say made in Pakistan mm -hmm. or is it going to say nothing? I don't think it's saying anything. But it's one of those ones. It's a very grey area to police. And it's like, who will who police it? And how far do you go with it? Yeah. How far would I go with it? Well, yeah. I was being very tactful there as well. Yeah. Can we, we supply a lot of these, like some of the shops yeah. as well. So it's a bit of a mix. It's a bit, I love it. We supply them, but then they've also we've got products in there as well. So we need them and they need us. Well, they'll carry Lock Heron brand yeah. as well as other yeah. things. Correct. Yeah. And everybody does it as well. Like, yeah. So, what are your what are your thoughts on um, companies that sell straight knockoffs of a particular tartan? Are well, they just filling a market and a price point, or are they absolute scumbags and should be hung, drawn, and quartered? First one, first answer there, first part of the question. They're filling. They're, it's a price point as well, but then they might be thinking, right? They need it in a cotton. We don't supply it in a cotton. They'll get it made somewhere in a cotton weight. No, 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 no. I don't think that's what the question was. It's if someone is like uh, uh, Rosemary and Sam Moist from that did the the Isle of Skye tartan. Yes. Now, if you don't offer mm -hmm. a a cotton material or a silk mm -hmm. fabric yeah. or something like that, and let's say Ingalls does a cotton or they do silk or right. whatever they, and they say, okay, fine, we are going to offer this in silk and they've gotten permission mm -hmm. and then, then they do yeah. the weaving, that's a different story. Yeah, that's that's fine. fine. Yeah. Now, what about companies that will say, hey, well, it's it's just a pattern. Mm -hmm. It's just an image. Yeah. Why can't we weave it too? Mm -hmm. But then is it for the Tartan Authority to police because they've got their registration? We kind of go around every shop and check what's in every shop. Nobody can. But it's, it's, it's very annoying when you see something like I, I'm, I'm, See, I'm, 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 I am very I'm half, much. I'm half dodging this one. Like I, I know you are. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I'll let you dodge it. Yeah. But I will say this: I am a, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it kind of guy. Right. And if I'm if I'm a supplier, and mm -hmm. again, I'm not a supplier, so I have the liberty to say this: um, if I'm a supplier and one of my customers is offering my product as well as a knockoff version of my product, my answer is, well, pick. You decide, do you want the legitimate one that you're buying from me and all of the rest of the products you're buying from me, or do you want to buy this imported one that does not have my approval, that is not my intellectual property that you're ripping me off on? Which one do you want? And if they say, well, we're going to keep selling that one, then my answer is, okay, fine, sell that one. You're not going to sell anything else from me. And uh, here, okay, I'm going to go, hold on, I'm not done. So... <laughs> Here's my thing. Here's my sales pitch to the industry as a friggin' whole. And I don't care. And I'm going to put you on the, I'm not really putting you on the hotspot because I don't expect you to answer this. But my theory is if House of Edgar and Martin Mills and La Karen and, you know, Strathmore and Batley's and whoever else all got together and said, look, we're going to draw a hard line in the sand and mm -hmm. either you're selling authentic stuff or you're not. And you draw that line as mm -hmm. a collective group. And I'm not saying that's an easy thing to get a consensus from five or six different companies, but if you could get everyone on the same page, you could do a lot of good slash damage, depending on how you look yeah. at it, to be able to say, no, either you're with us or you're against us mm -hmm. and segment the industry. So you're either selling cheap stuff that's tourist friendly, that's as much of a nice ribbon mm -hmm. that I'm gonna put on it, or you're selling authentic goods. I don't expect you to answer that. I'm not going to put you on the hot seat, but, but that's my theory. Right. Yeah, you're, you're right. Like, it's one of these questions, like, but then it's like, where do we start and how far do we go with it? Yeah, I know. Right. That it, is always it, the it, question. That is, it is, it's so hard. And it's like, because yeah, we do uh, Princess of Wales Tartan. Right. And you look up and make it, that's no hard. And we looked at that because of international property rights on it and it's like it's it's it cost more to take it to and how long it would take oh i know and then I the know, outcome I know. and it was like and ah uh, it's it's frustrating but then 
it's like, I, you never know. We might get a collective industry. I know. Insane. But then look at some things like, in, some things are protected by European law and has to only be made in certain areas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Harris Tweed, Champagne, yeah, that kind right. of thing. Right, so... Yeah. But tartans worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you manage that? I don't think... <clears throat> I've seen this before. I don't think you're able to... Because where do you draw the line? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if, you know, some people have said, like, okay, for it to be a real kilt yeah. or to have a Scottish kilt, it has to be, you know, hand-sewn in Scotland of Scottish cloth. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Then does... Strathmore, who has some of their cloth, or has their cloth woven in England, do they count? Um, does House of Edgar, who doesn't have Scottish sheep like you guys, do they count? Is a machine-sewn kilt in Scotland count? Does a hand-sewn kilt made by Barb Tewksbury, who literally wrote the book, The Art of Kilt Making, who lives in New York, but is making it from your hand, or from your Scottish wool mm-hmm. uh, cloth, does that count? Where do you draw the line with that? There's too many too yeah. many different things that muddy that water to be able to have a clear yes or no kind of answer to that one. Right. That's my, uh, my you know, it's one like, man's opinion. You know, it's a bit like Brexit for us. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. It's, it's a, a massive can of worms. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer. Yeah, there's, there's ultimately, there's no good answer. Mm-hmm. My answer is the only good answer. So yes, draw a freaking hard line and <laughs> this side or that side. Sorry. I'm gonna one more push for that, but no, I, I I completely understand the intricacies are not nearly that black and white as I am, you know. At at, at uh, I have the luxury of being able to mm-hmm. say it like that. You don't, nor do any of the mills who have to mm-hmm. rely on all kinds of customers from all kinds of places. So I completely understand it. I am going to end this question to get you out of that hot seat. <laughs> I'm gonna do one more, <laughs> Eric. Yeah. I want to do the question about the uh, single width cloth and the, the looms on that. You did discuss this earlier, however. Not fully. Uh, Matt Horn asked, why do some mills only weave certain tartans in single width? Wouldn't it be more efficient or economical to weave double width? Then you'd either have enough for a single great kilt or two single width tailored kilts. And on a similar note, William R. asked, when did you change over, LeCaron? from using shuttle looms to the high-speed rapier looms. So what is, why would you do single versus double and why did you guys choose to do this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go first. Right, yeah. I've done homework. Um, speaking of institutional knowledge being lost, um, the uh, uh, Bill Whelan, who's a good friend of mine, um, no longer works at House of Edgar, but the people that work at House of Edgar now, most of them weren't there when House of Edgar switched over to single width looms. So uh, I'm gonna speak kind of on behalf of House of Edgar, having done actual research and taken notes. Um, so <clears throat> House of Edgar single width looms. In I'm gonna paint the picture. In the mid 1990s, um, House of Edgar was experiencing a boom from Braveheart and from Rob Roy, and as the industry was in the mid 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, Lock Karen, I'm assuming as well. And what they were finding was all of their looms, they had a bunch of old Dob Cross looms, you know, and those looms, the newest loom that they had in the mid 90s was 1967. So all of their looms were very, very, very old. And so they were basically, their company was experiencing a boom and production, you know, the, you know, the desire for tartan was going up and their ability to produce it was going down because as one loom broke, they ha- would have to cannibalize, they had like the, the cannibalized loom where they would use one loom for pieces and parts and use, you know, okay, well, you know, this gear broke off of that loom. Great, take it off of that loom. And then this part broke off of that loom. Great, take it off of this loom. And then as they cannibalize too many parts, now they have to take the least working loom and make that one a parts loom. So the number of available looms that they actually had working was going down. So, uh, when and the other thing that they found was the, the technology of these looms was quasi-dangerous. As, as Bill put it, 
when you when you went to the weaving shed, you would almost have to wear a helmet because the shuttles would occasionally fly off the loom, and you'd have to kind of be like ducking and bobbing and weaving like a boxer walking through the weaving shed. Um, and the other problem that they had, as we kind of touched on earlier, was the tension of the of the bobbins um, of the shuttles was off. You know, or it could be off so that the, the bottom edge would have a little bit of a wavering kind of pattern. And the other another problem that they had with the old uh, 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 dob cross looms were that the, the darners would have to trim the floats on both sides of the cloth. So as you're, as you're weaving cloth, you know, when it changes from red to blue, you'd have to actually carry that red thread over to the next time red occurred. And then when you have an entire 80, you know, 80 or 80 uh, yard piece of cloth, someone would actually have to go up both sides of the cloth and trim off all of those floats. Um, so the late nineties, uh, technology was advancing and they approached the house of Edgar approached the textile engineer and they asked them to retrofit a high speed rapier loom to make a kilting selvage. This literally took five or six years as far as Bill's recollection um, to get this thing to work. It was back and forth, a lot of trial and error, trying to make a loom do something the loom wasn't meant to do. So the, they finally dialed it in, finally got it set. And they said, okay, we're gonna buy eight looms and we're gonna kind of patent the process. So those looms, those eight looms came online in about 2004, 2005. And House of Edgar changed almost all of their cloth in 2004-2005 to single width cloth. Now, the advantage was you, for an eight yard kilt, you did not splice it anymore. The disadvantage was the, uh, the cloth for a fly plate, the cloth for a great kilt has to be spliced. It can no longer be, you know, double width if it's only, if it's only 32 inches wide. Um, it also limited what you could do for upholstery fabric and stuff like that, which is an industry that needs a wider piece of cloth. Um, the other, the advantage was it was the, the high speed looms are, were twice as fast. They were getting 250 picks per second or picks per minute, um, twice as fast as a dob cross loom. The problem was it was only half the width. So that was kind of a wash. Um, but they did save time in the, uh, uh, in the, the finishing process. Now, uh, the double width, they also invested in some double width rapier looms, um, which were twice as fast as a single width rapier looms. So they got a lot more yield out of those, but it was definitely a process and it was definitely a, 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 a turning point kind of in the industry. House of Edgar decided in, two, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, that they were going to put more weight into making sure they're maintaining a kilting selvage at the bottom of the cloth for their looms. That's why they you know, invested so much money in the single width looms and invested time and effort in designing and bringing them, you know, to <laughs> creating, you know, Frankenstein, you know, Frankenstein's monster, bringing this thing to life. Um, but they also did double width rapier looms because those things freaking fly and that you can get a lot more yield out of those th those particular things now i know that la karen does have one had a couple rape or, mm -hmm. or, or single width looms how do you utilize those now um versus your double width rapier looms but the single width loom we've got the now we've got two but then one's sometimes used one's set up completely for single width Customer specials or uncenter tartans, what we've done in the past, have always kept single width. Um, it's Uncentered not, meaning asymmetrical, asymmetric, non matching yeah, tartans, correct? Like yeah. Buchanan, like Buchanan. Buchanan or McAlpine. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of them. Because yeah, McAlpine, several. it's either got a black line or a white line on both yep. selvages. McMillan so, Old, Campbell yeah. Dress, there's several oh. asymmetrical tartans. So the last shuttle loom we had in the mill was 1997. And that's when we bought eight new summit looms. Um, that's the ones we've just replaced this year, and it's like something again like a, everything grows old, and they're only 20, 20 odd years old. 
but the technology that they had in the circuit <coughs> boards, they were the ones that was causing the problems. The machine, the actual metal work, fine. But if something goes wrong, you have to send it away to get reprogrammed, or you get a second-hand circuit board, which it might be fine, it might not be fine. Yep. So that was the idea. So every loom we've got in the factory now is less than four years old, which the long that gives an hour twenty plus years of longevity within the factory. Um, we have got a pedal loom in the shed. In the mill. That's it, what they make you run on when you're it's bad? It's like, it's one of those things, it'd be a great project if you had time to kind of get up and running. Um, but it's finding the knowledge for some of the, the old worthies, how that or you know how it works, because it's, it's the same principle as the new looms, a bit slower. But we've got a single width pedal loom in the shed at the back. You're thinking, but it's like, how much time and money do you want to spend on that it's not going to be committed. It's just going to be a showpiece. Yeah. But then, um, for the long, as you touched on there, the speed of the loom is, like for us to go commercial, all our like, lightweight fabric goes into the fashion industry. So they needed the double width, 150 odd wide, or 63 inches. 60 inches. 60 inches. Yeah. Right. So we needed that width for that industry, and that's what we've kind of went for there. And getting stuff through the door. If you weave in Lamzo scarves, a 60 meter length will give you 180, 180 scarves, but we'll weave like six in the width. So you're needing that to get that volume through. It's just, it's kind of a commercial thing too, but then each mill is slightly different of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And what their, what their end products what are. Their end what their, are. Yeah. yeah, and they've got the market, we went this way and it works for us. And also with our fast looms, it's got a, a tuck-in selvage. When we went from the shuttle edge to a tuck-in, it was like, boom. But, the industry has come round to it too, like it, and it's never batted an eyelid. Yeah, there's like a, if it's 16 ounce strom, there's a thinner thread in it because you don't want a, you don't want a, f a fluffy edge. A that's thick, fluffy a edge. A thick, yeah, fluffy yeah. edge. That's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah, you need to watch. So we've done a wee bit of work with it, and it works, and I'd say 9.9 .9 customers are happy with the tuck in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I agree. It's uh, one thing that I. Uh, I never, I a, a tuck and selvage about a centimeter up from the bottom. You have a tiny little bit of fringe, an artifact of the weaving process, so to speak. Um, and there are some people who will say, no, 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 no. It has to be a nice, clean, kilting selvage. That's it. And, you know, there, but for, for my money, for my value, um, like all of our custom weaves that we do, we always do on a double width loom because you get a lot more cloth for, you know, a little bit more money mm -hmm. compared to a yeah. single width with a, with a proper kilting, air quotes, proper kilting selvage. And to your point, 99% of people don't don't see it, don't recognize it, and they're fine with either way. Mm -hmm. But no, it's good. It's There's a place for everything. It's, yeah. like, it's, like, there is, it's like we've touched up so many times this afternoon. There is a place for everything. And this is like our, this is our look. Yeah. And that's what we run with. It's your own, it's your own recipe. You're mm -hmm. all... You're all special flowers to me, Keith. Yeah, thank you. You're too. all individual <laughs> special snowflakes yep. with your own recipes. Yes, indeed. Buy Scottish made stuff, boys and girls. All right. Question of the day. Eric, do we have any, what are some questions of the day we could ask? I don't know. Hmm. Keith, do you have any questions of the day you want to ask people? No, I'm pretty cool. I'm fine. Pretty no? Okay. Yeah, I'm Very good. Okay, I'm going to ask questions of the yeah, day. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Does... Wool, Scottish made wool, or Scottish made, Scottish grown sheep, um, mentally move the needle for you in where you're buying your cloth from or not. I'm just curious. Would you, would you, if, if all things are equal, so the price of this, you know, price of this black watch is the same as the price of this, of this black watch, but one was sheep raised in Scotland, wool woven in Scotland versus New Zealand sheep Scottish woven wool. Does that move the needle for you? Do you care? Do you not care? Is it really down to the quality of the cloth and or the colors? That's the question of the day. All right. Thank you, boys and girls, for joining us. Until next time, Slanjava.